get started. Thank you, everyone. Welcome to the December 2nd, 2021 board meeting. My name is Song Oh, president of the board. Before we convene, I would like to remind everyone present that the board is a consumer protection agency charged with administering and enforcing pharmacy law. Where protection of the public is inconsistent with other interests sought to be promoted, the protection of the public shall be paramount. This meeting is being conducted consistent with the provisions of Government Code Section 11133. Participants watching the webcast will only be able to observe the meeting. Anyone interested in participating in the meeting must join the WebEx meeting. Information and instructions are posted on our website. As I facilitate this meeting, I will announce when we are accepting public comment. I have advised the meeting moderator to allow two minutes to each individual providing comments. This approach is necessary to facilitate this meeting and ensure that the board has the opportunity to complete its necessary business. I appreciate everyone's understanding. Before we get started, I would like to ask the meeting moderator to provide general instructions. Moderator? All right. Welcome to the Board of Pharmacy. Uh, before we get started, I would like to remind board members and staff who are not speaking to mute their microphones. If I detect background noise during the meeting as a result of unmuted microphones, I will provide a brief friendly reminder or simply mute the microphones. There are members of the public in the audience and meeting minutes are being taken. So I ask board members and staff to please identify yourselves before speaking. To facilitate public comment, we will be utilizing the WebEx question, WebEx question and answer feature. When the board president reaches a point in the agenda at, the, um, at which public comment is appropriate, uh, public comment will be requested. At the board's discretion, I will turn on and announce the opening of the Q&A feature. Members of the public can indicate they would like to make a comment by clicking on the icon with a question mark within the square located at the bottom right hand corner of the WebEx screen. These instructions will be displayed on screen at the time for your reference. Uh, for members of the public participating in the meeting via computer or tablet, you may indicate you, you may wish to make a public comment uh, in the Q&A box by clicking the raised hand feature at the bottom icon uh, of the participation panel. If any attendees utilize a profane, uh, utilize a profane uh, name or word, they will not be called upon uh, My apologies. While you are free to express criticism or negative views uh, for the sake of members of the public participating on the call, please do not use profane language when making public comments to the board. If you do not have a microphone, please click on the audio and video at the uh, top of, uh, of your screen and then select switch audio. If you need further assistance, refer to the how-to, uh, which will be displayed on screen. All right, Mr. President, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Really appreciate you. Following the open session as included on the agenda, members will convene in closed session. Due to technological limitations, adjournment will not be broadcast. Adjournment will immediately follow closed session and there will be no other items of business discussed. I would now like to take a roll call and establish a quorum. Members, as I call your name, please remember to open your line before speaking. Maria Serpa? Here. here. Hi, Maria. Good morning. Jake Patel? Here. Good morning. Hi, Jake. Good morning. Cheryl Butler? I believe Cheryl is attempting to join and she's having some technical issues, so she will, I'm sure, be in soon. Jose de La Paz? Present. Hi, Jose. Thank you. Shirley Kim? I don't believe Shirley's joining today. Ricardo Sanchez? 
Yeah, I'm, I'm present also. Hi, Ricardo. Good morning, Nicole Tebow. Good morning, Mr. President. Hi, hi, Nicole. Good morning, Debbie Veal. Hi, Song. Debbie Veal's here. Hi, Debbie. Good morning, Jason Wise. Good morning. I'm here. Hi, Jason, and I am here. The quorum has been established. The board will now entertain any public comments for items not on the agenda. To facilitate this portion of the meeting, as I previously announced, the meeting moderator will open up the line for individuals to provide public comment. You're not required to identify yourself, but may do so. As we open the lines, I would like to remind everyone that the board cannot take action on these items except to decide whether to place an item on a future agenda. Members following review of the public comments for this agenda item, I will survey to determine if any members have preference for items be placed on a future agenda. Mem um, moderator, please open the line for public comments. We have opened the feature, uh, the Q&A feature for public comment. If you would like to make a comment, please type comment into the Q&A box and you will be called upon to unmute yourself. When prompted, please click the unmute me. Please remember to send uh, the comment to all panelists. We're going to take a brief moment to allow people to type in comment. Seeing no request for comment, would you like me to close the feature? Yes, please. Thank you. All right. Um, President so Owen, go ahead. This is your co-moderator. We did have one request for comment pop in just as we were closing the feature. So oh, okay. if you could reopen that, you'll be able to see them. Okay, thank you. Go ahead. We have a request for comment from Paul Cummings. Give me just a moment, Paul, and I will send you a prompt to unmute yourself. You should have seen a request to unmute yourself. Please try again. I think we heard you, Paul. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead, please. Hi, uh, my name is Paul Cummings. Uh, I just want to comment on the um, the uh, the probation. Um, I just uh, completed the probation, and I just want to uh, uh, just thank the board and especially Inspector Samari just working with me. I uh, appreciate the board just giving uh, pharmacists a second chance just um, when they make mistakes. Uh, um, uh, for myself personally, five years ago, I thought about just giving up pharmacy, even though I loved the career after I made uh, mistakes in my uh, professional judgment. But Inspector Samari um, encouraged me to take day by day and really um, kind of reassert myself and go after it. And I appreciate her. And I just want to again thank the board for second chances and just been able to um, that the that the probation uh, it does work and it does uh, help. And it's helped me to, to be a better pharmacist. I would just like to say that uh, hopefully we can get some way for probationers to uh, get some employment because that was definitely the hardest part for me, just to been able to get a chance to be employed again. But again, I'm grateful for everything and thank you very much for the opportunity to practice pharmacy again. Thank you so much for the comment. Okay, we have another request for comment from Helen Chen. I actually see her message. Uh, we usually don't read this, but um, unfortunately due to this being a virtual meeting, we are not um, able to issue CE credits. I will actually put Anne Sotogran on the spot and see if she has any updates on that. Um, just. 
Hi, good morning, President O. This is Ann. Thank you for the opportunity to, to respond. In general, at this time, the board is not granting CE for attending um, board and committee meetings that are convened over WebEx. We are working with the Department of Consumer Affairs on a solution. However, we do not have that in place yet. So thank you um, for the opportunity to respond. Thank you so much, Ann. All right. And we have a, another request for comment from Jill uh, Simonian. Bear with me just a moment. I apologize if I didn't say your name exactly right. And I have sent you a request to unmute your microphone. Apologize. Didn't say your name exactly right. Hi. Hi, Jill. Go ahead, please. Sorry, I was having some trouble getting in. So I have sent you a request to unmute your microphone. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, my name is Jill Simone, and you said it correctly, and I am Apologies. in San Diego. Um, I am working exactly right. with a team of California pharmacists for the promotion Hi. of safe Hi, Jill, use. go ahead, please. Sorry, okay. I was having some trouble getting in, so. I have sent you a request to unmute your microphone. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm you. having some trouble uh, with the audio uh, here. Uh, yeah, Jill, I'm hearing echo here as well, Dr. Simonian. Um, I am working with a team of California pharmacists. I'm not sure what to do with this. Hi, Jill, go ahead, please. Sorry, uh, I, this is the co-moderator. Uh, Jill, I'm gonna mute you for a moment. Okay, so Jill, the echo seems to be coming from your end. I'm wondering if you have um, possibly two connections to WebEx open frequently that causes that loop back in the audio. I know you had mentioned you were having some trouble getting in. Um, I'm gonna unmute you again, let's give it a second shot. Okay, how's that? I think that sounds better. <laughs> Sorry about that. All right, I'll start over. Uh, my name is Jill Simonian. Like I already said, um, I am working with a team of pharmacists in California for the promotion of safe use of cannabis uh, in our state. This is including, but not limited to um, cannabinoid education for our pharmacists, uh, as long as, as well as other healthcare professionals. I know that we are all aware of our new uh, SB 311 Ryan's Law Bill that was signed by the governor earlier this year, uh, permitting the use of cannabis in terminally ill patients in healthcare facilities. Our team of pharmacists that I was discussing uh, has developed guidelines to help implement this bill in healthcare facilities to ensure the safety of patients and hospital workers and to educate staff about cannabis itself and assist with the compliance of federal and state regulations. So I would like to request that this topic be placed as an agenda item at the next meeting to discuss this bill and to address concerns that pharmacists may have. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Dr. Simonian. All right, any other comments you see? I don't see. I do not see any additional requests for comment. All right, let's close it. Members having received public comment, any members have any items they would like to put it on a future agenda? Again, please remember to open your line before speaking. Hi, uh, President, this is Jose De La Paz. Hi. Hi. Um, I, I missed the uh, doctor's name. Uh, what was uh, her name? Dr. Again? Simonia? Yeah. Um, she mentioned SB, was it SB 311? I believe so, yes. And the uh, request was to put uh, a an item on the agenda for us to discuss. Uh, was it SB 311 and just the safety and education? Is that what I got from her request? I believe the issue is a little bit more complex. Okay. Um, we can look into this issue, um, but 
uh, I mean, we could be, we could just put it as a uh, agenda item to discuss to begin with is okay as well. So, um, um, yeah, okay. that I would like, I would like that uh, to be put on the agenda if possible. Okay, sounds good. And uh, anyone second for Jose, please? This is Nicole, I second. Okay, thank you, Nicole. Sung, this is Maria. Um, discussion before we vote? Yeah, go ahead, Maria. My suggestion is that this be added to a committee discussion first before coming to the full board. Um, we presented on this topic in enforcement committee when the bill was passed and talked about um, some of the issues at there. So I'd be happy to take it on an enforcement should um, Jose and Nicole want to change their motion. That sounds good to me. Um, if, if that's okay with you, Jose and Nicole. I would adapt a friendly. I I agree. Sounds great. Okay, so motion and second. We're gonna um, vote on this. But before we vote, we'll open for public comment one more time. Just since we have a motion to put this agenda on the next uh, enforcement committee meeting agenda at the chair's discretion. We are now open for public comment. If you would like to make a comment, please type comment into the Q&A box and send it to all panelists. And we will unmute you uh, as soon as possible. We have a comment from Stephen Gray. Bear with me just a moment, please. And I will send you a prompt to unmute your microphone. I think we heard you, Stephen Gray. Please Thank go you. ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, before you vote, I suggest you uh, uh, determine when the next uh, enforcement committee meeting is, and then when the next uh, coming out of that enforcement committee meeting, when the, it could be on the full board meeting agenda. Uh, the law goes into effect January 1. Uh, it is um, in the statute, it is enforced uh, primarily by the California Department of Public Health, although there is a lot of concern, as Dr. Simonian said, with pharmacists who are working in facilities. So I agree that it should be on the agenda, but I'm concerned that the discussion needs to happen rather quickly and, uh, and in time for the Board of Pharmacy to discuss it, the whole board so that they can provide uh, input and communication to the California Department of Public Health. And in fact, probably there needs to be a uh, presentation or a discussion at the enforcement committee meeting from a member of the California Department of Public Health where there can be some discussion and uh, if it is going to go there first uh, or at the full board of pharmacy meeting. So I suggest you find out when, what the timing would be of all this since the law goes into effect January 1 and since there's a lot of uh, public interest and emotion about this issue people are going to want it to start immediately. We're talking about terminally ill patients in facilities. Thank you. Seeing no additional requests for comment, would you like me to close the feature? Yes, please. Thank you and thank you for the comments. Okay, so we're gonna vote on the motion, starting with Maria. Yes. Thank you, Maria. Jake? Yes. Thank you, Jake. Cheryl, I see Cheryl's back. So, Cheryl, are you here? Okay, we're going to get back to Cheryl. Uh, Jose? Yes. Thank you, Jose. Shirley? Shirley's not here. Ricardo? Uh, yes. Thank you, Ricardo. Nicole? Yes. Thank you, Nicole. Debbie? Yes. And Jason? Yes. Thank you, Jason. And I vote yes. And Cheryl, are you able to? I see you're unmuted. Yes. Oh, we can... can you hear Oh, me? there you are. We can hear you now. Okay. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you. All right. Oh, thank you. All right. And I vote yes. The motion passes. All right. And, and members, any other agenda items you would like to put it on the next um, or future agenda before we move on? 
Okay, hearing now, we're moving on. Um, also, we have a number of issues for our consideration before we proceed to the petition hearings. Before we begin, I would like to remind members that the following, uh, the 2022, February 2022 meeting, I will be establishing an ad hoc committee to consider standard of care as required under the provisions of Assembly Bill 1533, our sunset bill. I would greatly this appreciate- This is the moderator. We have we may have lost President O. Oh, let's give a moment and see if he returns. Hi, can you hear me? I can hear President O. Oh. I can yeah, hear him as well. I can hear you also. This recording. Okay. Okay. We're having Please a little bit of <laughs> we're having a little technical difficulties. Good old WebEx. Okay, so as I was saying. Um, I think that uh, my sentence was heard, so I'll, I won't repeat. Um, as uh, required under the provisions of Assembly Bill 1533, our sunset bill, I would greatly appreciate your interest in joining this ad hoc committee. Please contact me or Anne if you're interested. Thank you always for your participation in all of the board's activities. Thank you all the members and everyone that always is uh, participating in our meeting. Okay, moving on to agenda item three, presentation by Dr. Rita Shane on quality improvement study conducted on Senate Bill 1254. Members, I would like to welcome Dr. Rita Shane to provide a brief presentation on the quality improvement study. Dr. Shane, the floor is yours and thank you for coming. Uh, thank you so much, uh, President Oh, and uh, to the members of the board. Uh, for allowing me to provide this information. Uh, can you hear me, first of all? Yes, we can hear you as, and you can, as and, far okay. as I can. Okay, thank you. So um, uh, by way of background, um, this is actually closing the loop on a Senate bill that was approved um, in 2019. And I, I had actually previously presented this work um, or the rationale for the bill to, to this board um, who was in support of moving forward with legislation because of the importance of the patient safety implications of uh, research that was not only conducted here at Cedar sinai Medical Center, but was uh, well, um, well known and, and respected based on publications in the peer reviewed literature. So by way of background, uh, my name is uh, Rita Shane. I am the Vice President Chief Pharmacy Officer for Pharmacy Services at Cedar sinai Medical Center and also a Professor of Medicine here. Um, I thought I would be able to advance the slide, but I may need some assistance. So if it would be possible, could we advance the slide? Um, so we do not have your presentation. Oh, okay, um, okay, well, the, the, good news is, the good news is I do. So let yes, me so let me share I, the screen. That was my misunderstanding, I thought. Okay, no problem. Just give me yes, one. Yes, I, I transferred the presenter role to you so you could either share your yeah, screen or your application. So by way of background, which I think I can multitask in the interest of time, uh, what is what was evident uh, in, in 2017 um, was the growing body of literature demonstrating the um, the errors associated with medication histories. And so this is a particular issue in the um, hospital setting because patients are admitted with the medication histories that are then embedded into the electronic health record and then actually enable physicians to um, click continue. Um, these er any errors that may occur on the medication histories then become part of the inpatient orders and then the discharge orders. So a history introduced could then uh, lead to an error e even after the patient goes home and or during their hospitalization. Uh, I just wanted to check to see if you can see my screen. So Dr. what see now we can is see open your... window. How's that? Let me just go full screen now. Is this better? That's better. I feel like we're at the optometrist. Is this better or worse? Um, so should I, let me just ask you if I need to um, swap the presenter view so you can see the full screen. Can you see the full screen or just partial? So what, what you need to do now is at the top where it says display yeah, settings, if you sit swap, I perfect. Did. Okay, that's what I needed to do. All right, thank you. I can never tell, so I'm sorry, my, my camera, you're seeing the side of my face, but this is about the presentation, not about me. All right, so, so the, the, the genesis and the background, I think I've tried to, to communicate, but essentially what happens is in, in the real world setting, when any of us goes 
to um, any encounter in our, in, with our providers, there's generally a process whereby someone takes um, a medication list or updates our list in the electronic health record. That individual is generally a medical assistant and that individual does not have the training um, and knowledge and skills about medications. Um, in fact, their training is, is very, very limited. I've actually, that was part of the 2017 presentation to this board. And so as a result of that, what ends up happening is that populates this prior to admission list or our uh, prior medication history that then can be just ordered during inpatient stay. Now, organizations are expected to do medication reconciliation, but busy clinicians may not always have the time to do it. So, uh, based on the research that we conducted uh, here at Cedar Sinai, and as I said, research that's widely known in literature, not limited to Cedars, we found that there were an average of eight errors per uh, a medication history or medication list. And when we um, then did a further review, we identified that if those errors were not corrected, they went on to three errors on an inpatient, um, an inpatient's medication list, meaning three inpatient medication orders, of which, which 1.2 were severe life-threatening. So that was some of the work that we did, and that was a randomized controlled trial that demonstrated that actually trained technicians and pharmacists um, will re result in an 80% reduction in, in medication errors on inpatient medication um, orders. And so with that, uh, we had the, the evidence and we were able to get the support at that time from Senator Jeff Stone, who happened to be a pharmacist, um, as well as this board who actually helped guide and support um, the process, as, as well as other professional organizations, including CHA and others and CSHP, to have this become law. So this became law effective January 19th. Just one small anecdote, in, in 1998, my father had metastatic brain cancer and had adverse events associated with being admitted to another facility where there was an inaccurate medication list taken, which resulted in intractable agitation because he'd been on a corticosteroid, which if you discontinue that um, abruptly can cause all sorts of um, behavioral changes. So he had that and ultimately had to be restrained and ended up with an infection, ended up with an increase in temperature, fever, and was uh, rule out a serious life-threatening infection. And I had him transferred back and swore in 1998 that before I retire, I would do something about this. The bill passed um, in 2018. My father died September 17, 1998. So this is my father's bill. Um, I didn't call it that, but I thought I would share that because that's why this bill has always been important to me. So once the bill was passed, what, I, what we thought would be important was to see, did we make a difference? What was the impact of this bill in the state of California in terms of preventing harm? How many errors were we at, able to intercept? If we look not just at work that had, was done here at Cedar sinai but if we in, engaged other hospitals across the state in doing a, a focused study to look at errors um, that are identified and intercepted. And then we had also um, done some projections on cost savings associated with preventing harm. So we went ahead and, and, um, and recruited organizations. And what I'm gonna to present to you today is our findings. So uh, through the California Hospital Association and, and um, CSHP, we gave an invitation to organizations to, to join. We um, recruited um, this in, in 2019, and we, we created a toolkit and had a number of training sessions for organizations who wanted to join. Every organization that did join went through their own process with their institutional review board. This was a quality improvement study. We had office hours, we did training, and um, we, um, we worked with organizations um, in terms of how they would conduct this study. The study was, was um, conducted over six consecutive weeks for high-risk patients. And if, if you'll recall, the way the law is written is each organization defines high risks because we felt when we were working on the law that organizations have different types of patients and we didn't think it was appropriate to come up with a one-size-fits-all solution for the state of California. The study um, fortunately began before COVID, but you can see we got into that COVID space in March of 2020. But nevertheless, we we're happy to say that we were able to to complete the study. Um, we had 11 organizations participating and I'll share with you um, who they were. Six of the 11 are community hospitals. And so there's a process that we used to determine the severity of errors, which was analogous to the study that was conducted here and studies that have been conducted elsewhere. This is the National Coordinating Council's Medication Error Reporting and Prevention Taxonomy. And what we did is we utilized this wheel and then 
had the individuals who were conducting the histories ind indicate what the severity of the error could have been had the error not been intercepted. Then two pharmacists independently um, review that as well as an independent physician validation of all life threatening errors and a sample of serious errors. So we wanted to make sure that we weren't over reporting severity. We were very conservative about this so that we could see what the results truly were as opposed to, you know, inadvertently inflating that it was more severe than it wasn't. And I'll share some of the examples with you. Here are the participating hospitals, which we are really grateful for that helped us um, bring this to fruition to share with you today. Um, so what did we find? There were uh, 2,273 medication histories documented. So that was that's the number of patients who um, whose histories were taken during um, this study across those 11 institutions. There were 15,850 errors prevented, and there were an average of six errors per patient. So when we looked at um, the data here at Cedars, it was eight. I've seen anywhere from seven to eight in publications. For the purposes of this study, there were six. So 94% of medication histories had at least one error. So that I think that's pretty important. And no hospital recorded less than 87% across uh, 11 hospitals. 54% of patients who had medication histories completed had a serious or life-threatening error. And remember, these were all life-threatening errors were validated by, um, by two pharmacists and a physician, and uh, a percentage of all serious errors were also validated. So the reason this is important is that potentially serious and life-threatening errors have a higher likelihood of an adverse drug event if they reach the patient. So if that history wasn't corrected, it could go on to an error, as I mentioned, which we saw um, during the, the patient's hospital stay. And then it can then be continued at discharge. So this starts to create issues with patients having errors um, throughout, um, throughout not only the episode of care of the hospitalization, but even beyond. So in terms of the severity rating, 25% of the errors had the potential for serious or life-threatening harm. Uh, and this is somewhat consistent with, with some of the work we've done here and has been published elsewhere. So in summary, 2,273 medication histories were taken. The average number of medications um, per patient after the history completed was 13. So you can see um, that, that patients are on a lot of medications. And we certainly see this in our organization, and I'm sure we see this throughout hospitals in the state of California. 94% uh, of medication histories had at least one error, and you can see what the range was. 54% um, had a, a potentially serious or life-threatening error, and I mentioned almost 16,000 errors captured, of which one-fourth were serious or life-threatening. In terms of the time to take um, the history, the average was 40 minutes. We also collected this data because we, we rolled this into the economic evaluation. And 54% uh, of hospitals expanded their medication history programs as a result of the law, which is a, a three to tenfold increase in histories being completed. So from my perspective, when we were discussing this bill with sta the state board, as well as uh, with the legislature, um, we've improved safety in the state of California because the, there's so much evidence, including this study, that patients um, otherwise would, would experience harm due to significant adverse events. So let me share a few of them. This is, this is Debbie Veal. I just want to clarify. An error is where the something is uh, was listed wrong in the patient's profile. Is that right? Like whether it be the wrong right. dose of the medication or the wrong right. medication. Right. Okay. Right. I like the medication list, Debbie. So, you know, that's the list that the, that's updated in the electronic health record, and that forms the basis for all subsequent orders. So here's some examples. So this is the first patient, a 60-year-old, past medical history of atrial fibrillation, chronic kidney disease, coronary artery disease, and heart failure um, with right um, ejection fraction issues. The patient's medication list listed amiodarone, 200 milligrams, and the patient takes 400 milligrams once daily. So this was pretty serious because uh, the um, the wrong dose and rate would have been serious. This drug is used for um, irregular heart rhythms and the, the patient was taking an excessive dose, which could be problematic because of the risks associated with this particular drug. It's a lot of drug interactions with this drug. The second patient has had stage three melanoma status post resection and a history of pulmonary embolism. People who have pulmonary embolism are at, at risk for significant clots that are life-threatening. This patient was taking aspirin instead of the anticoagulant, Eliquis, that they should have been taking. Um, so they could have not only had a recurrence, it could have been life-threatening. 
The third patient had end-stage renal disease and a history of um, a, a deceased donor renal transplant, and they were taking the wrong dose of the, the transplant medication, which could have been life-threatening as well because of the, the difference between the dose that was listed versus the dose that they were taking. And the third patient was um, had on their list um, a drug that is also used for regular heart rhythms, but the patient, um, this was entered on the wrong patient. So this was one that was caught and of course it was discontinued. So this kind of just gives you a sense of the types of errors. Um, and having reviewed this kind of data for probably years now, probably a decade um, since electronic health records became kind of the standard of care. Um, this is this is not uncommon, uh, not only here, but elsewhere. And, and we are the only state, by the way, California should be commended, that actually has done something to try to fix this, at least in our hospitals. So let's talk about the economics, and I'm almost done. I respect uh, that you have uh, other things on the agenda, but I wanted to just kind of share. So what does this mean in terms of dollars? We actually had this data validated uh, by the USC Leonard Schaefer Center by an economic Economist, and we also had the data validated by Dr. David Bates, who's an internationally known patient safety expert out of um, Harvard. And so we did a very conservative estimate. So if you'll remember for our study results across these 11 hospitals, we saw six errors per patient, of which 25% were potentially life threatening or serious. We use that as a basis of the financial results that I'm going to share. I have all the detail if anybody wants, but for the sake of um, time and respect for um, for not getting too granular. I'm going to summarize the conservative results of the study. So the and this was based on um, also OSHPA data as well as you can see some of the other references which we had validated. So the annualized cost of harm prevented due to the adverse drug events, which would have increased the length of stay, is estimated to be 788 million to 4.4 billion. The reason this is a conservative estimate is because the economist didn't think we should take the full cost per patient day. He said we should take only the variable cost. The reason being is that, you know, utilities, electricity, air conditioning, administration, infrastructure costs of operating a hospital would not go away. So we were only able to apply the burial cost to the total, which is, by the way, different than the medication safety literature. Just to give you an idea, variable costs are only 16 to 33 percent of the total cost of a hospital day. So that's why this number, if you if you if you can extrapolate, would be much higher if we actually took the full cost of a hospital day. But even so, 788 million to 4.4 billion is still a respectable number. We also looked at the annual cost of harm prevented due to medication-related readmissions using our study data. Um, as I mentioned, if these errors aren't fixed, they continue to go on to continue post-discharge. So because we had 25% life-threatening errors and because 20% of, um, of admissions are medication related, we were able to calculate um, um, the cost of harm prevented due to readmissions to be 476 million per year. So when we add it all up, the cost is 7 million a year um, based on the 40 minutes per patient that I mentioned when we extrapolate based on um, the data available through the public OSHPOD, um, the cost of harm prevented is 1.3 to 4.9 billion. So to be to look at the bottom bottom line, one would have to subtract the 7 million from the 1.3 to 4.9 billion. And that those are our results. So I wanted to say thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to present, but more so thank you to this board who I've had the privilege of working with for many, many years and has always been the strongest advocate for safety in, in the country. We have led efforts and enabled patients to be safer as a result of the work that we do uh, with all of you. So I really appreciate the opportunity to present this data. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Shane. We really appreciate you taking the time from your busy schedule to provide us the board with information on the impressive outcomes stemming from Senate Bill 1254. If you're okay, I would like to allow members to ask any questions. Members, do you have questions for Dr. Shane? Hi, Song, this is Debbie. I have maybe just one or two. Um, Dr. Shane, thank you very much. Uh, you, you've always do such a great job in presentations and I appreciate when you uh, come and talk to us. Um, so the 11 hospitals that were involved in the study, do you think they're a good cross-section representation of the different type hospitals? Because, you know, I saw a couple, uh, you know, big names on there, but did we also represent some of the kind of more little community hospitals also? Yeah, I, I don't remember off the top of my head, but we actually looked at that. So there were hospitals that were, uh, well, any, well, 
Hospitals under 100 beds are excluded, remember, from Senate bill. You may not remember, but I remember. Right. Okay. But the um, but three, uh, the six of the 11 hospitals are community hospitals. They're not, you know, Cedar sinai uh, you know, Long Beach Memorial Hospital. They're, they're some of the Dignity smaller hospitals um, as well as um, some of the other ones on there. So, yes, they're six out of 11 were community, not academic or, you know, large hospitals. Thank you. That was one of the questions our economist asked us, too. We wanted to make sure that we were, you know, fair minded about this in terms of because um, we want to, our intent is to, to publish this in the literature. Thank you. Any any other members for questions? OK, uh, Jake, do you have questions? I saw you just unmute. Yes, I did. Thank you. Go ahead. Um, thank you, Dr. Shane, for the presentation. Um, definitely quite a bit of um, improvement in quality of care um, upon admit and um, um, the, the, the health care savings that goes behind it. It's pretty outstanding from what we saw. Um, I, I had one question for you. Um, you're so committed to this quality improvement um, in of patients admitted. I know that uh, upon discharge, some of these uh, medications that uh, patients are taking and the transition of care. Do you have any any study or data on um, how that happens upon discharge, or is there something? I mean, this is for future. I know it's not related to SB twelve fifty four. Uh, so the original SB twelve fifty four actually we we talked about this, you know, discharge because there is a a, a large body of data, body of data and. Um, you, your question couldn't be any more timely because um, within the last year, I actually um, implemented um, with our team uh, taking a look at the same issue at discharge. We obviously this is a much more um, uh, complicated uh, process. This is not one where pharmacy technicians can do it. It really requires a pharmacist, which is why we left it off the bill because I thought the bill would never get through. But to, just so you know, um, we are seeing um, a very, very um, concerning errors at discharge. We aren't ready to share the specifics as well, but but suffice it to say that we do see um, the, the need to really focus on this at the discharge uh, uh, piece as well. Um, so for, for every um, two patients we see, we see um, some significant errors at discharge. So I, I, our next kind of um, I guess our next phase of this transitions of care um, vulnerable episode, as, as you've so well indicated, is really to see how how do we get this hardwired. Um, you know, if if um, if this was something that uh, we could pursue, if this was um, if this was possible, and we wouldn't get a lot of pushback at, from from organizations, I, I think our patients would be much better served. What we do find is the ability to do this discharge review, the prerequisite is the medication history because you can't do, the discharge review will take much longer if you can't, if you don't have confidence in the medication history. But that being said, it is not uncommon to see issues at discharge. The pushback I could anticipate at the state level would be salaries because this would increase the number of pharmacists that are needed in organizations. But it's absolutely an, an essential safety step that um, that needs to be looked at. And I think the, um, I don't need to say this to this board, you know, pharmacists are trained and pharmacy technicians play a critical role as well to support safe medication use across all, all areas where we provide care. And so I, I firmly believe we need to own this process. And, you know, by putting this SB 1254 into place, we hardwired it at least for high risk patients in California. So sorry for my long um, commentary, um, but I really do believe the discharge piece is as important. So thank you for raising the question. Thank you, Dr. Shane. Uh, hi, ahead, hi, uh, ahead, Dr. Yes. Shane. Oh, sorry, President O, it's a board member Weiss, a public board member. I do have a question. So Dr. Shane, um, how do we uh, drive these numbers down of six errors per patient? What is the answer here? You know, I. I the, the reality of, uh, of how care is delivered is that individuals uh, have care provided in a, a number of different settings and the individuals who are obtaining that history may not have the most, um, the knowledge and skills, you know, a sustained release dosage form, you know, you've seen something where you take it once a day versus 
four times a day. I honestly believe the secret is getting the patient engaged so that the patient um, has an accurate medication list at all times. We're actually doing a project here with a high school to train high school students to take um, medication lists for their family members. Because I think that what what at the at the end of the day, we can't teach every every skilled nursing facility, every doctor's office um, how to take accurate medication histories. They're not going to hire pharmacists and technicians. It's cost prohibitive. So the best we could do is really uh, increase the awareness of of patients and engage patients wherever they receive care, that that list, if whether it's electronic or paper, depending on that patient and what their you know, technolog technology skills are, uh, has to have an accurate med list. I, that, I think that the patient has to have the source of truth because that way um, that is used as a basis as opposed to someone taking a history that may not understand the nuances of the drugs. A medication order is a sentence and just like we all went through middle school and passed English and know how, how, to, how to apply grammar, right? Um, most people don't know the grammar of a medication order unless they've been trained to do so. Thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Thank you again, Dr. Shane. I hope that uh, hope for the day where we have a full seamless transition from inpatient to outpatient and outpatient to inpatient and with all the harmony of physicians and prescribers and pharmacists being able to communicate to really take care of patients. I hope for the day to come, but you know, as I'm sure you know, it's a, a lot of work in progress. So thank you so much. Thank you. For, Thanks for the opportunity for doing it. So. Um, as a public agency, we also provide members of the public an opportunity to provide comments on the, each agenda item. So unless you have additional information you'd like to share, I'll ask the moderator to open the meeting for public comment. And also just a reminder, typically the board accepts public comment on the matter under discussion, but the topic, uh, the comment is not a question and answer session. And we generally do not provide responses, but uh, if any public member public has any questions or comments and moderator uh, if you could please open the line for public comments we have opened the line for public comment if you would like to make a comment please type comment into the q a box and send it to all panelists and we will unmute you when prompted we're going to take a moment now to see if we receive any public comments and we have requests for comments coming in our first comment is from Stephen Gray. Hold on just a moment while I send you a request to unmute your microphone. I have sent you a request to unmute your microphone. Thank you, moderator. Um, Please go ahead. Yeah. Um, first of all, uh, Rita Shane, thank you. Thank you very much. This is super important work. and. As you know, something that we've all known about for decades, and I'm glad to see that you have started the process of doing something. My comment would be um, that it's my understanding that very few uh, hospitals are have actually implemented that bill, and I I'm wondering if there is something that you feel uh, should be done to strengthen the bill, to strengthen enforcement, uh, because. Um, you know, we have a lot of hospitals in California. We have a lot of very um, many patients that are at risk. Um, what what needs to be done now to make sure uh, that this data is is goes forward to uh, strengthen enforcement? Thank you. Okay, our next comment comes from V H. Bear with me just a moment, and I will send you a request to unmute your microphone. You have raised your hand to ask a question. Sorry. You would you would you would lower your hand. My apologies. Hello. Hello. Uh, you're a little bit quiet, V. Okay. Got that. Hi. I just wanted to say that I had the opportunity to work yes. with Peter on this, um, all the improvement project from from your health, and I just wanted to see if it was going to be possible to get the final results sent to those. Sorry, 
access to those um, institutions that participated or if it will be published. Sorry, we're having a little hard time hearing you. Um, Is it possible that your speakers are close to your microphone? If you want to wait, you can't unmute it. Can you hear me? Yes, you're a little bit faint, and we've got a little bit of an echo going sometimes. Sorry, we don't know where the echo is coming from. I tried to mute everything on my. It's gone now. Okay. I just wanted to thank you to Rita for allowing John Muir Health to participate in this quality improvement project for its all community hospital development. So I thank you for that. And then also was wondering if it was possible for the institutions that did participate to receive the final results or a copy of the presentation so that we can show our administrators um, the results of it and then hopefully get support for expanding our TOC program. Uh, yes, happy to share. I guess a question um, from uh, to the board. I um, I didn't know if these slides automatically get also posted as part of the board meeting. Uh, we're happy to post with your approval. Yes, we can go ahead and post, but we will also make sure we get the results out to the participants. I actually thought that that had been done, so my apologies if it has. To a follow up. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Shane. Any other thoughts and anything you want to share with us before you go? No, thank you for the opportunity to share the results. Much, very much appreciated. And again, for the support, because this would not have been possible uh, without your support. Thank you. Thank you. We really appreciate your time. And thank you for your dedication and improving quality and taking care of patients and taking care of Californians. All right, so we're moving on to our next agenda item for discussion and consideration of results of workforce survey. As you recall, as part of the board's evaluation of medication errors and in response to information at the national level, suggesting that workforce issues may be a contributing factor to these types of errors, the board developed a workforce survey intending to focus on the community pharmacy setting. I would like to introduce Dr. Tracy Montas, Division Chief, who will be co-presenting with Anne to share some of the findings of the study. Um, Moderator, if you could please promote Dr. Montez and Anne, whenever you're ready, the floor is yours for both of you guys. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, members. Um, as um, President O indicated, one of the issues that was raised by the legislative oversight committees was the issue of medication errors. So in response to that issue specifically, the board acknowledged some of the challenges that have been identified and the media reports on the issue that were um, resulting from interviews with pharmacists describing, you know, um, working conditions maybe where they were understaffed or chaotic workplaces. So the board stated that um, the conditions in California could be different than those on the national level and noted that a survey on the working conditions would be appropriate. So subsequent to that, um, through the licensing committee and in partnership with the Department of Consumer Affairs and its experts, the board approved and released a workforce survey. The board received over 4,200 responses between May 7th and June 8th of this year. So I'd like to thank both board staff and DCA staff, including Dr. Montez, for your partnership in both developing the survey and assessing the results. So I'm gonna turn it over now to Dr. Montez for some opening comments as well. Good morning, members. Thank you for the opportunity to co-present with E.O. Sodergren. As shared, my OPS colleagues and I consulted um, on this project for the board. Uh, we want to just remind you that surveys are tools used to collect various types of data or information, and OPS is one of two units in my division of Programs and Policy Review that uses this methodology to collect occupation-related data. 
And as with any data collection tool, there are advantages and disadvantages. And with surveys, for example, they can reach a large number of individuals and collect volumes of information. However, surveys are typically self-report and the accuracy of the information obtained is dependent on the respondents and the overall response rate, that is how many people complete the survey. Uh, we attempt to use both qualitative and quantitative indices to verify the data reported and uh, a number of factors again, such as how many people respond will impact our ability to verify the data. We look at psychometric principles such as reliability and validity. Um, so again, this is self-report data. It's raw data, it's gone through some initial uh, data analysis. Um, and I will note some of our, what we would call statistical findings um, toward the latter part of the survey. Uh, but again, just a caution that this is self-report data and it's in an initial analysis of the data. Thank you very much and I'll turn it back to uh, Anne. Thank you, if we can go to the next slide, please. So the survey started with some basic questions, including whether or not the respondent um, was licensed as a pharmacist in California. So as displayed on this slide, 95% of the respondents indicated that they are currently licensed in California. Next slide. Further, um, we also asked uh, respondents to indicate whether or not they were actively practicing as a pharmacist in California. And again, the intent of the survey was to really drill down on community pharmacies in, um, in California. So this was another question, and as you will note, 91% uh, of the survey respondents indicated that they actively practice as a pharmacist in California. Next slide. So the survey also asked respondents to identify um, if their primary practice setting was in California. Again, we're trying to verify that the individuals that are responding to the survey are the, um, are the population that we're looking for to um, solicit the information that we're looking for specific to workforce in California. So you'll notice that um, the survey um, indicated that the primary practice setting in California was about represented 96% of those um, individuals that responded to the survey question. Next slide, please. So like I said, as, as indicated, it was the board's intention with the survey to assess the working conditions in community pharmacies in California. So as such, we also asked respondents to identify their primary practice setting. So as you will note from this slide, um, a little over or 29, um, 2,931 of the pharmacists that completed the survey reported working in a chain of pharmacy, 407 reported working for an independent pharmacy, and 932 respondents reported working in another setting. So as we continue through the remainder of the slides, um, we will be including the responses from those pharmacists that reported that they were either working in a chain or an independent pharmacy. And again, that's because that is what the um, focus of the survey was intended to collect. So if we could go to the next slide, please. So like I said, we're drilling down a little bit further as well. So as you will note on this slide, we have broken it, we have broken down the survey responses to those that report working in a community chain pharmacy versus those in a community independent pharmacy. So on this slide specifically, it's showing the, the responses to the question specifically, are you, design, are you the designated pharmacist in charge? You will note from the slide that the pharmacist um, that report working for a chain pharmacy, 34% of the respondents indicated that they serve as the PIC. So one more time, this is of those individuals that reported one, that they work in California, two, that they work for a community chain pharmacy, 34% of those indicated that they serve as a PIC. Using that same criteria only for independent pharmacies for respondents that reported working in an independent pharmacy. 
53% reported that they serve as a PIC. Next slide, please. So the next question that we asked was about whether or not as the designated PIC, do you feel that you have sufficient autonomy and power to fulfill the necessary requirements? So what's indicated on this slide are the responses from those individuals that indicated one, that they worked in California, that they were uh, worked in either the community or the chain, as you see the two different pie slides, and then also that they were the pharmacist in charge, right? So you will note that 56% of the PICs working for chain pharmacies reported that they do not believe that they have sufficient autonomy and power. And 22% of the PICs working for an independent pharmacy responded in the negative as well. Next slide. So we also asked respondents um, if they worked at multiple work sites or if they worked through a relief agency. So the data on this slide is broken down again by both chain and independent, but it's also broken down by those that serve as a PIC versus staff pharmacists. So this first slide, as indicated, shows that of those PICs that registered a response, only 4% of them report working at multiple work sites or through a relief agency. The percentage is slightly higher for those PICs that registered a response that work for an independent pharmacy, with 9% of those individuals indicating that they work at either multiple work sites or with a single employer. So the next slide, please. We then show the similar data. However, this is for non-PICs. So when we look here, what we find is that of those that reported that they worked for either a chain or an independent as indicated on this slide, do they work at multiple work sites? And what we find is 30% of those community pharmacy chain pharmacists work at multiple work sites or through a relief agency. That percentage is lower for those individuals that work for a community independent pharmacy with about 17% reporting. If we could go to the next slide, please. So we also asked about the typical work shift and again broke out the data by PIC versus staff pharmacists. So this slide shows the typical shift reported by pharmacists that identified themselves as a PIC at either a chain or an independent pharmacy. So I'm gonna pause for a minute because there's a lot of information on this slide, but you will note that 39% of PICs working at a chain pharmacy reported working eight hour shifts. 13% indicated a typical shift was 10 hours and 13% also indicated a typical shift was 12 hours. You will also note that 36% of pharmacists that identified themselves as a PIC at an independent pharmacy reported their typical shift as eight hours, with 21% reporting 10 hours as their typical shift, and 2% indicating a typical shift of 12 hours. All right, I hope you had an opportunity to see that slide. Next one, please. So when looking at this data for staff pharmacists for chains, we note that 48% reported eight hours as their typical shift, 8% indicated 10 hours as their typical shift, and 12% indicated 12 hours as their typical shift. For staff pharmacists reported and working at independent pharmacies. 49% reported eight hours as their typical shift, 11% reported 10 hours as their typical shift, and 3% reporting 12 hours as their typical shift. So I'm gonna pause for just another moment so you can see this slide in its detail. Thank you, next slide please. So we also asked about the typical number of staff um, working during a typical shift. So this first slide shows the number of pharmacists that were reported to be working during a typical shift. So as you can see, for the outpatient chain pharmacy, 
56% of the respondents reported that one pharmacist is typically working during a shift. You would find 52% of those working in an independent pharmacy um, work as a single pharmacist during a typical shift. So I'm again gonna pause for just a moment so that you can look at this slide. As you'll see, the numbers start and continue um, up the slide with the frequent, with the uh, increased number of pharmacists during the typical um, shift. And so, so Anne, do we, slide, think that, do we think that 1% that answered zero, they just didn't understand the question? Uh, so Dr. Montez and I did talk about that and think that that might be the case. Uh, next slide, please. So we also asked about the number of interns that work um, during a typical shift, and you'll see that there's the the percentages of zero is very high, and I think that that makes sense because, you know, from a um, from a licensee population perspective, we just don't have the same number of interns that we have, you know, as pharmacists or interns. So I wouldn't say that we find this, um, you know, surprising at all. Would note that um, in a chain pharmacy, they reported about 10% of those respondents indicated that there is an intern during a typical shift, one intern, and in an independent, about 12% indicated as such. So next slide, please. So we also asked them to provide a report on the number of pharmacy technicians that would work during a typical shift. And again, we have this broken down by both chain and independent. So uh, as you can tell from this slide, in an independent, uh, sorry, in a chain pharmacy, uh, respondents indicated that about 33% of respondents that reported indicated that there is um, a one pharmacy technician working during a typical shift. And in the independent, 34% um, of respondents indicated that there is one technician working during a typical shift. And then the numbers as, as um, as the frequency or the number of um, staff, number of technicians during a typical shift increases, those percentages are reported as well. The next slide, please. So we also did inquire and ask respondents to provide the number of unlicensed clerk typists that work during a typical shift. So again, we have it broken down by both chain and independent. Uh, this slide indicates that of those pharmacists that responded to the survey that work in a chain environment, 44% of them indicated that there are no unlicensed clerk typists working during a typical shift in the chain um, setting. And in an independent pharmacy, 16% of those that responded indicated that there are no unlicensed um, clerk typists working during a typical shift. So with that, I am now going to turn it over to Dr. Montez. Thank you, Io Soderguin. Okay, on this slide, we asked, what is the average prescription volume during a typical shift? And if you look um, at the slide, you will notice that the pattern is that chains typically receive more prescriptions as compared to independent pharmacies. The chart is a little confusing, so I'm, I'm going to clarify um, that we're looking at the percentage of each of the chain versus independent. So if you look on the vertical axis, and I'm going to focus you on, um, actually, let's start at the horizontal where it has 151 to 200. So that's the number of prescriptions, the volume. And you can see we have um, our chain and independent represented by the two different colors, green and purple. If you then look at the vertical axis, you'll see that we're around 17.76% for chain, 18.22% for independent. So it's of the chain pharmacies that reported, 17.76% reported 151 to 200 prescriptions, 
filled or prescriptions received, I should say. And then for independent, it again is 18.22% of those reporting uh, fall within the 151-200 category. So again, intuitively, um, we see again, chains are receiving or um, more prescription volume. The next slide, please. Survey asked, does your primary work site perform sterile or non-sterile compounding? And again, you can see here that these primary work sites uh, do not perform compounding mostly. We have both for community chain pharmacy, community independent pharmacy, 25.85%, 21.32%. Um, this was a statistical statistically significant finding, meaning that it was not due to chance. Um, and that's very clear on this. If you go to the next slide, please. We are digging a little deeper into this data. So our sample size is going to decrease because we're looking at those that did report that they do sterile or non-sterile compounding. Uh, we're looking again here the uh, chart community chain pharmacy for sterile compounding, you can see that 37.5%, we have zero to five. But again, note that only eight individuals or eight pharmacies report it. Uh, with community independent pharmacy, sterile compounding, 11.11 .11 reported zero to five. Um, again, uh, only nine overall um, reported. Um, again, most of them were unanswered, uh, most likely because they do not uh, perform compounding. If you go to the next slide, it's also very similar in terms of the non-sterile compounding. We have community chain pharmacy, community independent. Um, these two slides, the prior one and this one, we are reporting really just in the spirit of transparency, but again, you're going to note small sample sizes as most of these pharmacies uh, do not do compounding. Moving on to the next slide. We asked which of the following services are provided at your primary work setting. We have it broken down by chain and independent. You can see um, quite a few uh, differences in the types of survey, uh, services provided although um, they do uh, parallel each other, the chain versus the independent. Next slide, please. This question looked at as a pharmacist, are you required to perform these services? For community chain pharmacy, we see that 95% of the respondents indicated yes versus 57% for community independent pharmacy. So again, a difference here that can be noted. Next slide. Again, the average number of immunizations administered, we see here one to 20 is where most of that is done. Again, though, it is based on the percentage of the chain versus independent that have responded. We know we had much smaller numbers for independent pharmacies reporting. Next slide. Question 18 looked at whether or not uh, these respondents believe they had sufficient time to provide adequate screening prior to the administration of an immunization. Here, our community chain pharmacies reported no, they did not have adequate time at 78%, whereas community independent pharmacies reported that yes, at 56%. This was also statistically significant. Again, not due to chance. The next slide looks at whether or not the primary work site uses an automated drug delivery system. Community chain pharmacies reported no at 79% versus community independent pharmacies reported 75% did not.
question 20, does the primary work site employer use workload metrics in the following areas? You can see we have a large number here that did not answer. However, we do have um, the results across a number of areas. And you will see that chain pharmacies do use metrics more so than independent. And this, again, was also statistically significant. So you can see it across refilling for waiting patients, new prescriptions, um, and down through the list there. Another question asks whether or not the primary work site has a work queue that monitors the wait time for a prescription. You will see here chain pharmacies, community chain pharmacies, yes, at 90% have a work queue that monitors wait time whereas community independent pharmacies reported at 33% that they do. So a difference here also statistically significant. Next slide. Does your employer require non-dispensing related duties? An additional question for community chain pharmacies. Yes, at 97% whereas community independent pharmacies, 72%. This was also statistically significant. Again, not due to chance. Next slide. On average, what percentage of duties, of the respondent's duties, time is spent on non-dispensing duties? Okay, again, this is, uh, remind you, a small sample size because we are just focusing on uh, those who report um, non-dispensing duties. And again, you can see here some differences between chain and independent. Are medication errors appropriately documented and evaluated consistently with the board's quality assurance requirements? Now, again, this is where we do the caveat of self-report data. Uh, here, we are focusing on the pharmacist, pharmacist in charge. So you're going to see our total respondent numbers drop down. You're also going to notice that we have a percentage here of unanswered. But essentially, we look at community chain pharmacy, and of those answered by the pharmacist in charge, we have 62% are report that they appropriately document and evaluate consistency with the board's quality assurance requirements, whereas, again, community independent pharmacy only answers by pharmacist in charge are also 62%. Moving on to the next slide. We're now looking at the staff pharmacists in terms of the medication errors appropriately documented and evaluated with the board's quality assurance requirements. Here we have community chain pharmacy. We have 54% reporting yes. Community independent pharmacy reporting 55% yes. Again, the numbers are smaller. Response rates not as small though as the uh, prior slide. Next slide. What was the cause for errors documented at the primary work site? Again, there are several uh, options here. We do have an answer, as you can see, with also a selected. Um, but some to point out here in terms of statistically significant between independent and chain pharmacies where our incorrect quantity, our incorrect directions, and incorrect drug Question 25, what is the average number of medication errors that occur in a month at your work site? Again, self-report data. You can see that most pharmacies report about one to two errors a month, and it is broken down by chain in independent pharmacy. 
The next slide. What we did is we ran a correlation between prescription volume and medication errors, and we found a slight correlation, a slight relationship. That is, the greater the volume, the more errors, which intuitively also makes sense. In terms of the strength of correlation, we would need to do some additional analyses, and potentially um, this is impacted by the um, sample size or response rate of the survey. But again, we were able to find a, a correlation to support, again, what one would intuitively consider. The next slide. Do you believe you have sufficient time to provide appropriate patient consultation? Community chain pharmacies reported no. They do not have uh, sufficient time. Whereas community independent pharmacies say yes at 68%. Next slide. Do you believe the pharmacy staffing in your primary work site is appropriate to ensure adequate patient care? Community chain pharmacy says no. At 91% and 1,932 responses. Community independent pharmacies report 63% yes. Total response 236. Again, you can see in our last two slides that the sample size does drop off a little bit, self-report, um, uh, but it is good information. So in summary, um, we have attempted to provide you with some information about community pharmacies, drilling down between chain versus independent, showing you some patterns that um, some appear intuitive. I would hope some are also informative. And again, with the caveat that it is survey, it is self-report data, but it's always a great starting place and a great opportunity for individuals to provide data um, to a board or a program uh, that can be used um, for informing and for possibly future projects and so forth. So at this point in time, I'd be happy to open it up to questions um, that EO Soderbrin and myself uh, can answer. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Montez. I appreciate you working on this. So as Ms. Ann, um, thank you so much. Um, so I, as I open up this agenda for discussion, I note that uh, I understand as pharmacists, we cannot be perfect as we are human, but we know that as regulators, we must seek the best for Californians. I believe even one medication error is still too many. We must seek ways to improve pharmacy practice to address medication errors, leveraging the information we have learned today. I am announcing the creation of a medication error reduction committee that will take a deeper dive into the findings of the survey results and consider if there are recommendations that can be offered to reduce medication errors. Please indicate if you are interested in serving on this ad hoc committee. I recognize that we all have a tremendous amount of work, but I am hopeful a few members will be available to participate. I anticipate the first meeting will be January 27th. With that, members, do you have any questions or comments for Dr. Montez or Anne? Um, Hello? Hi, Cheryl. Do you have comments or questions? Well, I just, I just want to say I appreciate um, getting the results of this work or survey, and I appreciate the time that went into this. I, I, I pretty much um, felt that the results, I'm not really surprised that because of conversations I've had, and I certainly would like to be on uh, the committee. Thank you, Cheryl. Any other member comments or questions? Uh, hi, this is Nicole. Um, I just wanted to say thank you for putting this together and really appreciate the way it was broken out, not just by the two types of pharmacies, 
but also whether or not they were uh, a PIC. This was really helpful um, the way it was presented. Um, like Cheryl, I am not surprised by some of the results, but I actually was a little surprised by the scope of, of some of them. Having 91% of chain pharmacists believe that they don't have adequate staffing was uh, a little bit surprising. Um, and I too would be interested in participating on the committee. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. Appreci appreciate it. Um, any other comments from members or questions? Obviously, there will be a lot more opportunity to discuss this issue. So, but in and uh, please feel free to speak um, on this issue if you have uh, anyone. Okay. All right, moderator. Um, Jason, do you have comments? I see you're unmuted. I just want I just wanted to say uh, thank you uh, to uh, Tracy Montez and to Anne uh, for all the work in pulling this together. I, as a public member, um, was somewhat surprised at uh, the prevalence of the, of, um, of the chain pharmacists um, versus the independent pharmacies of uh, not being able to ensure uh, safety of uh, of their patients. So that was concerning. Um, so thank you for all the work. Thank you for the comment, Jason. All right, any other member comments before we open up the line for public comment? Okay, all right, moderator, please open the line for public comment. We have now opened the line for public comment. If you would like to leave a com make a comment, please type comment into the Q&A box below uh, and send it to all panelists. We will unmute you. Uh, we will send you a request to unmute your microphone, and you will have two minutes to speak. And we have a request for comment from uh, Stephen Gray. Bear with me just a moment, and I will send you a request to unmute your microphone. Thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, comment on this. I also appreciate all the work and all the expert analysis uh, that has gone into the results of the survey. That is very, very important. I believe, however, that one of the uh, aspects of the survey that can explain the difference between the responses uh, from independent and chain is that when um, the survey asked whether the person, the comment, uh, excuse me, the respondent was a PIC, it not it did not differentiate, uh, but in the independent category, whether the PIC was also the owner of the pharmacy. So um, I think that would make a significant difference, uh, perhaps in what the response would be in, in many of the questions. Uh, the owners of a pharmacy are the ones that uh, provide the resources, the staffing and other resources, and where the PIC of an independent pharmacy that is not the owner seldom has the ability to make those decisions, if at all. So I think that that's something that when the committee looks into this, they may need to further analyze what's going on. Also, I think that there were some confusion when you say chain, whether it included, um, and I know in some of the responders that I talked to, whether that included um, supermarket pharmacies, uh, big box pharmacies, and other types of institutions other than what we typically think of as the chain drugstore type. Uh, just those comments uh, might be helpful going forward. Thank you. Moderator, did we lose you? All right, we have another request for comment from Keith Yoshizuka. I have sent you a request to unmute your microphone. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. This is Keith Yoshizuka, president of the California Society of Health System Pharmacists. I want to applaud the board for taking this action and looking into um, strategies for reduction in medication errors. Um, I'm old enough to recall back when the California Department of Public Health initiated their efforts 
uh, back in 2001 with their uh, medication error reduction program or MERP. And uh, I'm hopeful that the um, program that you're embarking on has similar results that will result in um, reduction in medication errors in the outpatient venue. Thank you very much. Thank you for the comments for Dr. Gray and Dr. Yoshizuka. And I don't see any other um, comments. So if you could please close the Q&A. Thank you, moderator. Thank you again, Dr. Montez and Anne for working on this and really appreciate your time presenting this data and looking forward to a further discussion on this issue. Okay, we are moving on to agenda item five, but it is 1033. So I'm going to survey members to see if anyone need a 10 minute break. Yes, please. Okay, sounds good. We'll take a 10 minute break and back at 1045. We'll see you back. Everybody's back. Hey, okay, Maria. Maria, are you back? Not yet. Jake? Present. Hi, Jake. Cheryl? Yes. Hi, Cheryl. Jose? I'm here. Hi, Jose. Uh, Ricardo? Ricardo, are you back? Okay, we're back to Nic Ricardo. Nicole? Uh, yes, I'm here. Hi, Nicole. Debbie? Debbie Veal? Yes, I'm here. Hi, Debbie. Jason? Hi, I'm here. Hi, Jason. Uh, Maria, are you back? I'm back. Thank you. Hi, Maria. And Ricardo, are you back? Ricardo. Yes, I'm here. I'm here. Oh, hi, yeah, there I'm you here. are. Hi, Ricardo. Thank you. Okay. All right, everybody, moving on to agenda item five, discussion and consideration of application and enforcement of business and professions code section 688 related to forwarding of controlled substance prescriptions, including potential statutory amendments. Members, as detailed in the meeting materials, requirements for e-prescribing become effective January 1st of 2022. As part of its implementation efforts, the board has provided education on the requirements, including development of frequently asked questions, which are posted on the board's website. Recently, as part of the public comment, the board received a request to further discuss the provisions related to unfilled, unfilled Schedule 2 through 5 control substance prescriptions and the requirements to transfer or forward such electronic prescriptions. The meeting materials detail out in greater detail the issue. In preparation for this meeting, I work with the board staff to develop a statutory change that could be one means to address the concerns raised. The proposed language is included in the meeting materials. Also, before I open this item up for discussion, I note that subsequent to release of the meeting materials, the DEA released a proposed rule related to the transfer of electronic prescriptions for scheduled control substances between pharmacies. I believe this rule could address some of the challenges that have been expressed from stakeholders and members. This item specifically cannot be discussed by members today, but I want to note for interested stakeholders that comments on the proposed rule must be submitted by January 18th, 2022 to the DEA. As I open up 
this item for discussion, I would entertain a motion on the proposed statutory language if you believe it would be appropriate for the board to pursue such a change. Uh, members, any thoughts or comments or anyone willing to make a motion on this issue? Okay, so um, this is uh, Debbie and um, I am totally in support of trying to make some sort of a change. However, I think we might want to just look at the um, proposed and make sure that it's going to accomplish what we want to accomplish specifically in regards to, I know we're not going to talk about the DEA stuff, but my understanding is that the DEA has decided that they're going to come out and make a ruling. So is there a way that we can include that in um, in our proposal here, something to the effect of, you know, we need to see what that ruling is before I feel before we um, we kind of you know push this off. But um, so agree that, with yeah, agree so, with you. So I think maybe we need to make a modification to this. Um, uh, and, and I've kind of poked around with the NCPDP standard, and and what I learned is it's actually out there just that it hasn't really been adapted or implemented so I, I think we also need to um, look at exactly how we word that I mean so I, I don't know you know one suggestion that was you know we could just say um, instead of having one or two we could just say that you know, we could look to the rule making adopted by the Drug Enforcement Administration, allowing for these types of transfers. But then I feel like we have to build in some time for us to all put those uh, IT changes and you know NCPDP stuff in place. So I, I don't know if we can put a time limit in there too, like maybe give everybody a year after the DEA um, comes out. So I don't know that this. I feel like I'm kind of doing a brain dump here, but just some things that we I think we might want to change. And I would I would say we don't want to necessarily accept what's here. I think we need to modify the proposal. Um, but I do applaud you guys for thinking ahead. I just think maybe now that we have that little bit of information, we have to we need to think a little bit further ahead. Sounds good. Sounds good. Okay. But, um, so this is ahead, um, this is. I apologize. This is Anne. Um, I'd like to ask um, Eileen if she can kind of chime in. I think that um, the condition number one, if if the DEA acts and allows for it, I think it would. Um, I think it would be covered under number one because there would no longer be. Um, it would no longer be a violation of federal law. But I would appreciate Eileen's thoughts on that. Um, hi, this is Eileen, and I, I would agree. Um, the way that the proposal was drafted for the statutory was in the event that the, you know, the feds acted. So if the DEA rule, if the DE, DEA um, adopts a final rule allowing these type of transfers for um, unfilled prescriptions, then it will, it will no longer be a violation of federal law. Um, and I think number two also would be covered um, I think the one thing I heard um, Member Veal state was that maybe she wanted, if we were going to propose statutory changes, um, to also maybe um, propose maybe adding a year after, you know, um, the adoption of the DEA rule, but would that be solely with respect to forwarding of an electronic prescription for controlled substances? Uh, yeah, I, 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 I was laser focused on this, so I, I was uh, thinking specifically around forwarding, forwarding of um, a, a controlled substance, uh, you know, what's being discussed in this um, here. So, yes, I, that is what my comments were in regards to. I mean, thanks. Mr. President? But I guess, I, I'm sorry, can I just say one thing, Maria, before you jump in? Do you think we need to kind of spell out number one? Because I understand um, 
uh, you know, from, from your viewpoint, from Anne and Eileen, that, you know, you understand that number one is this, uh, you know, does take into account the, the DEA rulemaking, but um, I, I'm not sure that that's um, plain enough language. And so maybe for someone like, like me, when I first read this, I didn't understand that. And so I would think we might want to make that um, in clearer English. If that, if we're saying the same thing, I just would promote that we might want to make that in clearer English. Um, sorry, Maria, I kind of stepped on you there. Um, could, could I answer that? This is Eileen. I would say I kind of like the idea of not making it too specific because, for instance, if we tie it to passage of a final DEA rule, the DEA might put out some type of guidance between before it adopts enforcement discretion, um, policy statement, or something else. And if we make this change narrowed solely to passage of the final rule, it might not give us enough flexibility if the DEA decides to provide guidance before um, a final rule becomes adopted or um, finalized, if that makes sense. Okay, I appreciate that. Maria, what are your thoughts? Um, I just have a couple of comments. One is, um, you know, I appreciate we're trying to um, address a, a concern that is a national issue. This is not just a concern in California. And um, I'm not quite sure if uh, how much time and effort it is uh, required to propose a statutory or legislative change uh, for this issue that appears to be uh, in motion in mo uh, and changing. And so I think it may be because of the efforts it requires to put a legislative item forward and looking for a sponsor and the like um, going through the legislature and where we are now, I think it may be premature in suggesting a legislative solution to a national issue that is um, changing quickly. So I, I appreciate this language, but I would suggest that we kind of hold off and see where we are in another month or two um, before making any legislative suggestion. Thank you. Okay, sounds um, sounds good. Thank you for the comments. So I think the concern we had and the reason why this was brought upon, obviously, as I'm sure all of you understand, is because this becomes effective January 1 of 2022. And the language under 688G seems to say that it is a requirement so that the, the transfer has to happen. But the concern we heard was that it is either a not a lot allowed practice or a uh, technically not possible. So uh, um, it, hearing from some of the comments, I'm curious to see um, what path do you see a forward into making sure that our our um, you know laws are not broken in adversely uh, for for um, taking care of patients in in this section of the law? Hello, Sam. Hi, Cheryl. Uh, yeah, I, I just, I have just uh, one question and maybe I'm not understanding it. Um, um, my concern is, is as a, a patient myself, uh, will a pharmacy be able to transfer my prescription to another pharmacy if I choose not to get a prescription filled at that pharmacy um, uh, once it, was called into that pharmacy. So will holding off on this, uh, um, you know, keep me still from having the ability to do that? I think Cheryl, the, the, that's exactly the, the, the core of the issue because even if, so let's say, uh, I, I don't wanna get too technical, but let's say a prescription for a control substance was sent to a pharmacy A, and a pharmacy A, for whatever reason, is unable to fill the prescription, um, and that prescription was sent electronically to pharmacy A, 
And that pharmacy in this law under 688G is somehow required to transfer or forward a prescription to another pharmacy designated by the patient. But the, obviously the problem is that is not a possible action under current law as well as possibly current technical standards. So what essentially would have to happen is the transfer or forwarding of the prescription would not happen and that a pharmacy, alternate pharmacy, either or you as a patient would have to contact a prescriber so that the patient's prescription would be sent to a pharmacy B. So the transfer or forwarding would not happen. So in this situation, the law requires something to be done, but it is not possible for it to happen due to the reasons listed here. So therefore, um, we are kind of putting that pressure on the pharmacy A to be in some sort of a violation of our law if there were to be a complaint or if there were to be an issue arise from that situation. So I don't know if that explains the, the issue at hand. It's very technical. This issue is obviously not um, simple, so. Thank, thank you for the explanation. Okay. All right. So how do we move forward is the question. Debbie, any suggestions or? I mean, I, I agree with you. I, I I hear what Maria is saying, but I agree with you. the summary you just gave to um, Cheryl. I mean, we we have to do something because we're telling the pharmacies you have to do this, and yet and they don't really have the ability to. So, um, I mean, I would like to. I mean, um, Eileen, you. I think you are kind of maybe suggesting um, some language based on what I said earlier. Can, did I misinterpret that? Can you, you know, suggest maybe how we could massage this? Um, I think what, what I suggested was, I think the language in the proposal is, is good because it gives more flexibility. The question would be whether or not um, if we were, if the board was going to go forward with a proposed um, change to section 688, whether we wanted to also include um, like a one year implementation, you know, um, deadline after um, the change in federal law or after it's supported by um, the different um, standards for controlled substances. So I, I would like to add that, I guess, is that number three or does that come before think, one and two? I think we would just mm -hmm. probably amend. Go ahead, actually, Debbie. Um, I think Eileen or um, Debbie, go ahead. I mean, no, I was asking Eileen, would you make that like a uh, number three? I think I, think I would um, make it as number three in this case, because that's why I had asked you before whether you wanted the one year delay only tied to the transfer of the controlled substances. Um, and so I think by doing that, um, by putting it in G, that the rest, that the implementation date for the rest of 688 would go forward. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, so I would make the proposal, um, let's see, do we have a, we have language here. I I would um, like to make a motion to kind of to that um, uh, to to with that modification for number three to pursue uh, a, a statutory change through the legislative process. Um, asking the staff to I don't know if it's the executive officer and the um, president. Uh, the, or maybe it's just executive officer, the ability to make non substantive changes. Um, so uh, possibly the motion I, could be. Oh, and do you want to take that? No, go ahead. Um, it would be so Debbie, are you, you suggesting that um, that your motion is to adopt the proposed statutory language presented um, on the screen and in the, the materials with the addition 
of a subsection three asking for an implementation delay of one year after the change in federal law um, and when um, the transfer is supported by those um, IT standards and yep. then delegate to the executive officer the ability to make non-substantive non changes. Yep, that would, that's it. great. Thank you very much. And did you want to say something? Yeah, so I, um, I'd say perhaps it's pursue a statutory change to BPC code 688G with a one year delay following the necessary changes to the laws or the standards. And um, if agreeable, um, delegating uh, for the board president to work with staff to finalize that language and then work through the legislative process. Is that agreeable, Debbie? Is that okay? I'm fine with that. Okay. Anyone willing to second for Debbie's motion? This is Jig, I'll second it. Okay, thank you, Jig. Motion and second. Any other member comments? I understand this is a very technical issue, so um, please. Uh, yeah, go ahead. This, yeah, this is Nicole, sorry. Um, I just wanna make sure I'm following this totally and with what the, what the issue is. So um, what we're concerned about here is that you currently can't, it, it's because of the DEA. So we're, we're only concerned at this point about the controlled substances, but if the DEA goes ahead and makes a change that could correct the federal law that, that, that's blocking this. So we're not worried at this point about non-controlled substances, is that, Right. Am I understanding yes. this correctly? This, okay. this is only for electronic prescriptions control substances. Electronic prescription. And, and then and, can and, I, and can the, I, Nicole, can I just clarify ahead. one thing of what you said? Um, yes, the DEA we're worried about, absolutely, because it sounds like they are going to kind of jump in here and make a rule. But the other thing is we're worried about the NCPDP standard for the way, you know, pharmacy computers currently communicate with each other and with, uh, well, payers and, and, and other ways. It's not, it's, it's not ready to do it. So the, the pharmacy computers actually can't do it right now. Um, right. And so we're trying that to kind of delay until that catches up too. Got it. And that was going to be my second question. So then, Assuming that the the non-controlled substances or oh sorry uh, sorry my dog's barking or that the controlled substances um, does get approved, we can still pharmacists can still transfer it verbally. Um, let's just talk about non-controlled for now because that's easier. Pharmacists can still transfer it verbally even if they do not have the technical ability to forward the electronic piece yet. Is that True? Am I understanding right? So right there, Nicole, uh -oh. that's an excellent question. And that right there is is what makes also um, very, very complicated and this issue very technical. Um, it, it would first depend upon what the DEA's proposed rule would be on their amendment. Um, but also I'm I I don't want to discuss, we cannot discuss that today, so I, 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 I want to be very careful. Um, and, and secondly, obviously, the technological standard, because um, usually my understanding is they are trying to not allow the verbal transfer as a method of transferring control substances, but and that's why the technological piece is in here. Um, so, but obviously for non-controls, it, it, it really wouldn't, it, it doesn't matter, you know, for, for verbal is okay. And, and right, but I, in this case, um, hi, this is, I mean, because we didn't agendize the non-controlled substances, we shouldn't be talking about that. We, okay. we only put an agenda item on the controlled substances. So we're kind of um, narrow to what we can discuss with respect Thank to you, that. Thank you, Eileen. Thank you, Eileen. Thank um, you, sorry. Yeah, Nicole, so um, does that answer your question? Yeah, I think so. So so basically right right now we have dual issues of not having the capability and then what what the DEA rules are. But it is not 
us and our rule that is preventing, potentially pre preventing a verbal transfer, it is the one that I have the wording as it is. Is that correct? Yes, I, that is. I think where it comes down, Nicole, is currently California law effective January 1, 2022, is going to require pharmacies to um, transmit to Ford or, um, what's the exact wording, Ford or immediately transfer an electronic um, prescription to an alternative pharmacy designated by the patient. However, current federal law does not permit that with respect to controlled substances. And there's no technological capability, probably because it's not permissible under federal law right now to accomplish that. So effective January 1, 2022, a pharmacy that receives an electronic data transmission prescription for a controlled substance um, would either be in violation of California law for not forwarding it or in potential violation of federal law if it does until the law changes and um, the technology exists to actually effectuate those transfers. I understand. And so that's why we need the time period. That's why we need to add the time period because it's not going to be instantaneous and they likely wouldn't happen at the exact same time. All right, I get it now. Thank you. Yeah, awesome. the, you need the time period because it just takes time, Nicole, you know, to, to build the IT. So, you know, when, once you know what the, you, you can't build it until you know what the rules are. And so, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, that, thank, that, thank you all so much. That's why I suggested the time period. Yes, I, I appreciate it. Thank you. I was just missing the the, the piece of, of what the time period was, was going to allow us to do, but I, I get it now. It's multi-layered. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Nicole, and thank you, Debbie, for bringing that up. Um, any other member comments? Okay, we're going to go for the public comment. Uh, moderator, please open the line for public comment. We have opened the line for public comment. If you would like to make a comment, please type comment into the Q&A box below and send it to all panelists. You will receive a prompt to unmute your microphone and you will have two minutes to speak. And our first comment is from Danny Martinez. Bear with me just a moment and we will send you a request to unmute your microphone. All right, and we have sent a request. Go ahead, Danny, when ready. Thank you. Uh, this is Danny Martinez with the California Pharmacists Association. So I I was going to testify in support of the language that um, the, that is presented right now up uh, um, in, for the meeting materials. Um, I wanted to bring the attention of the board to something. So I, I think what we're talking about, and maybe somebody who's smarter than me can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe the controlled substances we are discussing that are the issue is not all controlled, but rather controlled two, because I believe three through five, you can transfer um, uh, and it doesn't have to be electronic. It can be an oral or, or whatever the case may be, but you physically cannot transfer uh, a, a controlled substance to you'd have to have a, a brand new prescription for that. So I, I don't quite understand why there's a need for change or, or a delay itself. Um, if we're talking about pursuing the board pursuing a statutory change, presumably that change would not be effective until January 1, 2023, and then further adding a year delay would make it 2024. Um, and and so I'm not sure that that's even what what we what we're all talking about trying to achieve um, in terms of this conversation. I would say the language, the way it's currently written, addresses all of the issues that you guys are bringing up right now. Uh, and, and I also wanted to add an extra comment about the, the script standards. So per the existing law or per the law that's going to be law on January 1st, 2022, uh, of these exceptions to the e-prescribing mandate, uh, subsection E9 already states that prescriptions that are issued uh, that include elements not covered by the latest version of NCPDP script standard do not have to follow the e-prescription mandate. So if a pharmacy uh, uh, receives a, a prescription that's not script standard, then it doesn't have to follow the, the e-prescribing mandate. So I don't know why there's an issue there in the first place. I guess it's 15 seconds. 
subsection two under under proposed G um, would make sense to clarify it. So I, again, I'm just I would testify that I we're in support of the language the way it's currently written, and to not add that extra year of delay. Time is up. Okay, next we have Lindsay Gallahoon. Bear with me just a moment, please. Lindsay, I have sent you a request to unmute your microphone. You have two minutes. Thank you. Um, good morning, President O and board members. This is Lindsay Goldhorn with the California Retailers Association and National Association of Chain Drugstores. Um, first, I want to thank you for considering this issue and very much appreciate the work that um, board staff has done in drafting this legislative proposal. Um, we absolutely are supportive of the board pursuing legislation to address this issue. Um, and I do agree that a legislative fix is needed because pharmacies won't be able to comply with the law um, going into effect January 1st. Um, in response to Mr. Martinez's comments, um, legislation is absolutely needed. Um, in theory, an urgency bill could be introduced, which would go into effect immediately, so it might not be until 2023. Um, and there still is this requirement in the law that requires that these controlled substances be transferred electronically, and we just can't do that. Um, so I, I respect, respectfully disagree. I do think that we, we absolutely need legislation. Um, as President O and board member Veal mentioned, the DEA's rulemaking addressing these unfilled electronic prescription transfers between pharmacies will result in changes federally um, that could have an impact on the ability of pharmacies to comply with this requirement. So I think the fact that the DEA is moving forward with new regulations shows that the DEA and the pharmacy profession aren't ready to implement the transfer requirement. Um, and therefore, the, the California requirement needs to be delayed until there is more clarity. Um, I also agree with board member Veal. Um, it will be helpful to have explicit language specifying that the requirement does not go into effect until after promulgation of the DEA rule. Um, so again, thank the board for hearing our comments on this um, and for considering a statutory fix. We would also respectfully request some kind of formal enforcement discretion until the new legislation. 15 is seconds. Um, just because. As the, the transfer requirement can't be implemented when the new law goes into effect on January 1st. So again, um, committed to being available to work with you. I know this is a very technical issue. Um, thanks for your time. Next on the list, we have Stephen Gray. Bear with me just a moment, please. Stephen, we've sent a request to unmute your microphone. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, go ahead, please. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Um, I am concerned with uh, something that I've just heard. Uh, section uh, E9 does not apply to transfers. It only applies to um, the prescribing originally. So it's section G that applies to transfers. I am concerned, section G basically says, is it gives the patient the right to have the prescription transferred. It says a pharmacy shall, and then it goes on to say immediately transfer. The way uh, subsection two, the proposed subsection two, it would eliminate that if there isn't an NCPDP way to transfer it. So basically, uh, According to the question asked by Nicole, I think it was, uh, this section uh, G2 as proposed would say a pharmacy did not have to transfer a prescription orally uh, because the you know, they can wait until NCPDP allows for it to be transferred. And I want to make sure that's what you intend, which is to uh, change the law to, re to remove uh, the requirement that a pharmacy must transfer a prescription at the request of a patient. So also, I would suggest that the board consider making comments uh, to the DEA rules rule. The DEA proposed rule uh, says it only applies to retail pharmacies only. So this would, uh, if that's not changed, then this would eliminate the ability of many pharmacies to transfer a prescription, uh, which 4052A2 in California law gives every pharmacist the right to transmit a valid prescription, whether they're in a retail pharmacy or otherwise. 
So I think that it's very important seconds. that we get that amended. Thank you very much. Next, we have John Gray. Bear with me just a moment, please. John Gray, we have sent you a request to unmute your microphone. John Gray, you appear to be unmuted, but we cannot hear you yet. Sorry about that. I was double muted. Appreciate that. Um, this is John Gray. I'm a registered pharmacist with Kaiser Permanente. Um, we appreciate the board's willingness to engage on this important issue, um, and we believe that the proposed statutory changes go a long way towards resolving the key issue that without an electronic standard to perform push transfers of electronic prescriptions, pharmacies will be unable to comply with BBC 688G. We would like to suggest one change to the board's proposed language of BPC 688G2 to provide clarity on the time point at which um, NCPD script standards are considered to be available and to ensure that pharmacies have adequate time to implement the electronic standard for push transfer of electronic uh, prescriptions once that standard is available. We suggest that the board consider um, slightly altering BPC 688G2 to read uh, the action is not supported by the version of the National Control of Prescription Drug Program script standard as specified in Part 423 of Title 42 of the Code of Federal Regulations as amended from time to time. Uh, the publication of a new script standard represents the beginning and not the end of a process by which pharmacies and other industry stakeholders implement the new standard. Uh, after this standard is published, pharmacies will need adequate time to modify business processes, develop and test systems and software changes for implementation, deploy the developed software, and engage in user training. We absolutely welcome the one-year implementation timeline that Board Member Veal has proposed um, adding to the statutory change, uh, but we also believe that including a reference uh, in the statute uh, to the recognition of the script standard in Title 42 of the CFR will help provide that time that pharmacies need to develop, test, and implement the necessary software changes after the standard has been published. 15 um, seconds. Additionally, as um, my colleague Lindsay Gullihorn mentioned, um, because the requirements of BPC 688 will go into effect on January 1, 2022, we'd also recommend including an urgency provision within the text of the bill that will modify the requirements uh, of BPC 688G. Your time is up. Uh, thank you again for the opportunity to provide feedback. Next, we have Keith Yoshizuka. Hold on just a moment, and I will send you a request to unmute your microphone. We have sent a request to unmute your microphone. Thank you for the opportunity, Keith Yoshizuka. Um, I am appreciative of the Board of Pharmacy's uh, progressive position in a number of areas. However, in this one area, uh, might I humbly suggest that uh, maybe consulting with the New York Board of Pharmacy, because this law went into effect in New York three years ago. So they have a little bit of experience with it and uh, they might be able to provide some language. So that's, that's my suggestion. Thank you. Okay, and next we have Mark Johnston. Bear with us just a moment as we send you a request to unmute your microphone. We have sent you a request to unmute your microphone. Hello, Mark Johnston with CVS Health. Um, is I understand, first off, I really appreciate the board's effort here. Um, as I understand um, the issue, uh, uh, at first, NCPDP standards um, had to be developed, which may or may not uh, be uh, developed. And then SureScripts has to develop their IT interface, which may or may not be developed. Um, and then our companies will all have to go to work to develop that interface. Um, that I do know a little bit about, and it is a, a very cumbersome um, and lengthy process to develop that IT interface. Um, I'm glad to hear that Mr. Martinez's members um, all have their interfaces developed so that they're able to 
uh, participate on day number one that the DEA rule goes into effect. Um, we really do have to wait for that rule to understand what the interface will even look like. Um, and then that rule may in turn change the NCPDP standard, which may change sure scripts interface. Um, so it, it may get um, a little cyclical, but the, the reason I'm excited to hear that Mr. Martinez's members are all gonna be able to be uh, functional on day number one is a transfer involves two pharmacies. If a patient wants you to transfer a pharmacy, there's a transferring pharmacy and then the receiving pharmacy. Um, so we need the entire industry to be on board or else the pharmacy who attempts to transfer to a pharmacy who cannot receive um, will uh, potentially have the transferring pharmacy non-compliant with law for something that they can't control. So yeah, really appreciate uh, uh, CAPH. Thank you. Okay. And we have no additional requests for comments. Would you like me to close the feature? Thank you. Thank you, moderator. Okay, with a motion and public comment, and uh, we are going to take a roll call, but just wanted to make sure before, since we had a lot of comments, I wanted to make sure any members had any other thoughts or comments before we vote. Okay, we are going to vote. Maria, how do you vote? Yes. Thank you, Maria. Jake Patel? Yes. Thank you, Jake. Cheryl? Yes. Thank you, Cheryl. Cheryl votes yes. Jose? I vote yes. Thank you, Jose. Uh, Ricardo? I, I vote yes also. Thank you, Ricardo. Nicole? Yes. Thank you, Nicole. Debbie Beal? Sorry, I'm still at uh, unmuting myself. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Debbie. Debbie votes yes. Jason? To avoid any appearance of a conflict of interest, I will abstain. Thank you, Jason. Understand, and I vote yes. The motion passes. Okay. Thank you, members. Moving on to the agenda item six, discussion and consideration of adoption of Board approved regulation, Title 16, CCR Section 1715.65, inventory reconciliation and discussion and consideration of public comments received during the 45 day comment period. Included in the meeting materials is background information on the regulation. Thank you, staff and council, for preparing detailed responses to the comments received, as well as recommended modified text for the board's consideration. I am hopeful you all had an opportunity to review the meeting materials, including the comments received and staff recommendations. I note that staff are recommending modification to the language to address in part comments received. Also, Ms. Tantayan and Smiley are available to answer any legal questions you may have on the language. Comments received and staff recommendations developed in response to comments. In reviewing the comments, I agree with the recommendations of staff and would like to hear from other members. As a part of your comments, I would also entertain a motion. Should others agree with the recommendations from staff, I note the meeting materials and the slide displayed. Uh, if you could go to the next slide, include a possible motion. Um, members, any comments? I understand this is another very techno technical issue. Um, so, um, Let's let's get started. Any comments? Mr. President? Yes, Ms. Marie, go ahead. Hi, thank you. Um, I just wanted to uh, comment to, to the rest of the board that, you know, as you stated, this is a complex um, regulation, but it's been in discussion for several years in enforcement committee. And I'm so glad that we're coming to the end of the road for um, pot potentially uh, moving forward with adoption. I uh, agree and appreciate all the um, public comment and agree with the uh, additional uh, changes to clarify the intent of the committee and to get this language out um, to the uh, public, to the licensees so that they could actually, I know many places have already started doing this function in anticipation. And so um, I, I guess that's a roundabout way of my saying I, I, I agree with the suggested changes and would move for the language as adopt uh, the adoption language as posted on the slide here 
instead of reading it all. Um, that's my motion. Thank you, Maria, for the motion. This is Cheryl. And I second. Thank you, Cheryl. Appreciate it. Okay, so we have a motion and second. Um, but I, I would like to make sure everybody has an opportunity to comment as this issue is also, um, as mentioned, technical and has been in progress process for a very long time. Debbie, I see you unmuted yourself, yeah. so <laughs> go ahead. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm good or bad, sometimes I, I, I always have thoughts. Um, so I also, I really appreciate a lot of the, the cleanup that was done on, on on this go around, because I, I think we cleaned up a lot of things that have been kind of brewing out there. Um, I, I have a question, and maybe uh, this is aimed more at. I have a couple questions, but the first one is, and Eileen, this might be aimed more at you, and you can just help me understand it a little bit better. When I look at um, at the beginning, so I'm looking at uh, uh, little a. Um, and then we go to, and it talks about, you know, reports that are, are needed. Um, inventory reconciliation reports shall be prepared in the following basis. Um, you know, 1, 2, 3A. When I look at 3B, as I read that, I feel like 3B is actually a situation where a report isn't needed, and I feel like maybe it's a little bit confusing being there and so should there be three and that would be three a and then b would actually be its own little item and i'm, I'm thinking maybe it's small b um and then small b becomes c because it, i feel like that section is talking about situations where you don't need a report and i feel like it's under um, an area where it's asking for reports. So I, I have a couple other questions, but can can we just talk about that first? And, and, and I am not a lawyer, I'm a pharmacist, so it might be my, um, you know, my, just my ignorance, but could you, do you understand what I'm saying? And does that Not at sense? all, that'd be great comment. Go ahead, Eileen. Okay, Sheila, I first wanted to check to see if you wanted to cover this it deals with the structure of the rule sure i can do that can you hear me okay yes we can yeah, thank you Shema. so i think it's a very good question um and i'm looking at it from the perspective of the office of administrative law so three begins you know it follows it dovetails um, two and it starts with for any controlled substance not covered by paragraph one or two and sets forth the reporting requirements. Um, the B was meant to follow that because it is, again, related to items one and two, inventory activities for each controlled substance not covered by paragraph one or two. So I see your comment about, you know, one requires reporting, one does not, but three is meant to, uh, to come after items A1 and two and delineate when you need a report and when you would not need a report. So I hope that helps. Okay. I mean, as long as it's as long as it's clear that you know it seems activities. like activities. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it seems like one, two, three are saying you need a report, and then three B is saying except for me. Yeah, right. So you don't need to do reconciliation report. You need to do the activities. Yeah. Right. 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 Okay. So as long as that, that's clear, um, I just want to make sure. I, I believe it's it's more clear for it to be a capital B um, instead of a small B, you know, because you need to know that that is an exception to the reporting requirement. And instead of doing a report, these are the activities that you have to do. Okay. Um, and then I guess the clarification with A, so it seems like that's saying that a pharmacy should have a report for any loss. Um, I think 1715.6 says that we, we, that a pharmacy, we would actually report that loss 
if it's like 99 pills or units, whatever it is, or greater. But is A saying then that the pharmacy should have a, a, a reconciliation report for any loss? Um, but you might not necessarily send that to the board because we only want like, um, you know, we only want when there's a pattern and it's you know more than I think it's 99 or whatever it is. Is am I interpreting 3A correctly? Another great comment, Debbie. Go ahead, Eileen and Sheila. It was meant to clarify the requirement of 1715.6 for reportable losses and then to set a minimum threshold for when there is a pattern of losses identified by the PIC. So, but I guess when I read this, it seems like, and I apologize, my phone's ringing, so I'll mute myself after I ask this real quick, but it seems like it's saying that the pharmacy has to create a report for any loss, but we only report to the board um, when it hits the minimum, is that what it's saying? Um, this is Maria. I could speak up okay. to the intent and then maybe you could speak up to whether that meets the intent. Sure. Thank you. I'm reading it again. So go ahead. Okay. Cause I know this was, you know, we had many years of discussion. The intent is that this report is an internal reconciliation report. And so that's the word maybe getting confused because it's required by the licensee to complete a full reconciliation when there is a loss. So uh, now what, when you need to quote unquote report to the board, that's different, you know, notify, I guess maybe a different way of saying it, but they were meant to be different. So this is an internal report in this regulation. And then the other regulation that we're gonna be talking about next is about when to report slash notify the board, they're different. Is that helpful? So, so Maria, um, that that is a little bit helpful, and I'm, I, I'm, I apologize because I was I've only been I'm kind of a new member to the enforcement committee, and I know we you know talked about this and in, um, in the you know larger board, but um, but so if I I mean it seems like you are um, validating my summary that this is expect the pharmacy even if there's one pill. I should have a, an internal report about that one pill. Uh, and then um, I don't have to report my loss unless we hit my minimum. But it seems like that's what this is saying. Now, Sheila would, would be able to speak to what is it saying? Uh, I could just speak to what was the intent. So was that the intent? So the would intent was, yes, that? That, every, that every time you had a loss that the site would do a full reconciliation to determine the loss and hopefully to uh, ameliorate it so it does not reach to the level of reportability uh, rather than only evaluate those that are reportable. They should be evaluating all. That was okay. the intent. Okay. So Sheila, does that um, change any of what you think is in the writing? Does it meet the intent? I believe it meets the intent and that's what we were trying to do. Um, because we wanted to have this reconciled and compatible with the reporting drug loss regulatory requirement. Okay. Um, and I guess then I think my, um, I, I just, I know I've, I've brought this up in the past, the, the need for this, uh, uh, signature on some sort of a document every time you work. I, I feel like we've we've kind of created a regulation here that focuses on the lowest performing pharmacy system versus um, taking advantage of the highest performing pharmacy system and making the lowest guys still have that documentation, but the guys with the really great pharmacy systems and like even looking in the future, um, that, you know, it just drives me crazy that this, uh, you know, having to have this, you know, what signature because we're afraid that not all pharmacy systems have a trackable way of knowing that, a, you know, who, who actually uh, did the reconciliation um, of, the, of the product. Um, I, I just think we're, 
we're putting it into practice something that, you know, I, I wish that we were more forward looking in, in this document, um, because I think that that's that's too bad that we are not handling it forward thinking. You know, maybe having a placeholder for the, the pharmacy systems that aren't that are antiquated, but I would I wish we were a little bit more forward thinking. Um, my last comment is on H. Uh, it looks like if you're in, in an inpatient hospital only and you have an ADDS system, you can rely on the ADDS systems. Um, ability to to create this report and you don't have to actually do it. Um, so my question, maybe Maria, this goes to you is. Um, it seems like more than just inpatient hospitals might have this type of a system. Um, you know, it seems like maybe some long term care or others that have a, you know, the. ADDS systems that have this accounting. Could also be part of H and not just specifically inpatient hospitals. Um, so I don't know. Do you, can you do you have any history? Around yeah, that's a way? that's kind of a convoluted thing because you know the regulations on ADDS is, lives in several places um, and there are different requirements. So in most use, which is in an inpatient setting, the, those sites do not require board of pharmacy licensure. So they have also a whole QA process that is in a separate regulation about how they're inventoried and how they're monitored. Um, whether they're licensed or not, um, there's a little bit of differences. And I think the, the important point was, you know, going back to like, what is the count that you use? And so for an example, I'll just kind of make it real practical. Uh, the count, and your, your point is a good one. Should it be expanded to more than that? We felt a little uncomfortable in making it expanded, but the, the point is, you know, typically when you're doing a reconciliation, you pick a, uh, a point in time, a date and an exact time that is your marker of the beginning count and of the end count. And in a uh, ongoing 24 hour use kind of, of, of a medication management system, you can't send out 200 people to go inventory all your ADDSs at, you know, 12.01 AM. Um, so what we do in um, is use the technology and, and have the system present a report of what the count is at 12.01 um, and the system provides a report. So it's not an individual going out to count it. Well, we felt that in the uh, other uses of the ADDS where they may not be doing daily inventories or shift inventories or monthly inventories, the rules are different, that there could be a um, unknown discrepancy in those environments. And because of that being a possibility that we suggested that that, that be a requirement, that the time that you do that inventory for all of your, in, all of your locations, including ADDSs, would include a person counting at that exact time and not an electronic report of what the system thinks it has. Kind of complicated. I hope I made that a little more clear. <laughs> I think we could probably grow in the future to being, if we cleaned up a lot of the other um, regulations on how inventories are done to make them consistent across um, locations, but right now there's different requirements for different locations. And this is Sheila. Um, these are very good questions. I'd just like to note that there were no additional changes from the previous text in either E or H. Agreed. Yeah, and we had no public comment on it. I think we talked a lot about this in um, uh, committee because of the point of it would be impossible to count every ADDS at the exact minute across your organization. You would have to hire a whole bunch of extra staff just to do counting. Okay. All right. Thank you, uh, Song, for allowing me to ask my questions. Absolutely, Debbie. Thank you for the questions. Those were great questions. And um, any other member comments?
Okay, we're gonna open the line for public comment. Moderator, please open the lines as appropriate. We are now open for public comment. If you would like to make a comment, please type comment into the Q&A box and we will send you a request to unmute your microphone. Please send it to all panelists and you will have two minutes. And our first comment is gonna come from John Gray. Hold on just a moment and I will send you a request to unmute your microphone. Okay, John, I have sent okay. you a request to unmute your mic. Okay, thank you very much. Sean Gray, registered pharmacist with Kaiser Permanente. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to provide comments on this important regulation. Uh, as I said in our written comments, we commend the board's ongoing efforts to promulgate regulations that enhance controlled substance accountability, um, as well as to um, amend this regulation to specifically address many of the questions about the regulation that um, are frequently asked of board staff by the regulated public. Um, I would like to address our suggestion uh, that the terms acquisition and disposition should be defined in the regulation, which is comment number five in your packet. Um, I think it should be clear to everyone that the manner in which this entire regulation must be implemented hinges on the meaning of the terms acquisition and disposition. Um, th therefore, I think it's a little bit of a mistake to assume that every member of the regulated public and every board of pharmacy inspector will have the same or even a sufficiently similar personal definition of these words. Um, I am personally aware um, of more than one situation in which attempts were made to hold a pharmacist in charge to what I believe were dubious definitions of the terms acquisition or disposition. And in those situations, I know it resulted in a great deal of concern and unnecessary work to clarify the actual requirements of the regulation on the part of the affected pharmacist in charge. If these terms are not defined within the regulation, I think it is likely that misapplication of the regulation will occur in the future. Um, I also believe that the portion of the board staff response that is related to defining dispenses from ADDS devices as dispositions uh, does not necessarily address the root of our comment. Uh, the intent of including a dispense from an ADDS device within the proposed, our proposed definition of the term disposition is simply to codify the board's stated position on dispensing from ADDS devices within the text of the regulation. Specifically, the initial statement of reasons seconds. for this rulemaking clearly indicates the board's position on, uh, on drugs and devices dispensed from ADDS as are considered to have been dispensed by the pharmacy. In order to reduce the likelihood of future confusion, uh, I strongly suggest that the board reconsider the decision not to define the terms acquisition the disposition in the regulation. Thank you. Next, we have Keith Yoshisuka, hold on just a moment, please. All right, Keith, we have sent you a request to unmute your microphone. Thank you very much. Um, I met with a group of hospital pharmacy directors in the uh, San Francisco Bay Area this morning before this morning's board meeting, and I'm relaying their concerns uh, about the amount of additional work that um, this modification and expansion would require. Uh, I also am uncertain uh, about the um, degree of um, accountability, uh, particularly in light of the fact using the federal guidelines for inventories to the nearest one-tenth of a package for controlled substances three and four, um, is the expectation that the inventory be to the individual dosage unit. Um, I'm, I'm un unclear on that. Thank you very much. Next, we have Paige Tallery. Hold on just a moment. We have sent you a request to unmute your mic. I think I'm unmuted, am I? We hear you loud and clear. Go ahead, oh, great. please. Thank you. Paige Tally with the California Council for the Advancement of Pharmacy. 
I just want to comment on H, which is the in hospital ADDSs, inpatient hospital ADDSs. Uh, I want, I appreciate board member uh, Veal requesting that all ADDSs be included. I understand what uh, Dr. Serpa said, but I would like to see in the future that um, there are some kind of resolution here that the ADDSs in every setting don't have to be included in the inventory, that they can be done electronically. Thank you. Next, we have Mark Johnson. Hold on just a moment, please. We have sent your request on mute your microphone. We do not hear you yet. Your mic shows as unmuted, but we cannot hear you, Mark. Do you have me now? We have you now. Go ahead, please. Oh, I'd appreciate my two minutes starting now. Thank you very much. These expansive changes require extensive and costly IT changes for which we request a one-year delay in implementation to complete as per my comment number 14. Uh, <clears throat> response to comment number eight, the board staff recommended that the language uh, be amended to establish a minimum criteria to initiate an inventory reconciliation report stemming from a loss. However, as I read, A3A, it still requires an inventory reconciliation for a single tablet, continuing an administrative burden for pharmacies for a loss for which the board does not want to be burdened with themselves. Um, in comment number 12, I requested that the requirement to physically sign a printed statement confirming the accuracy of the inventory report in E1 be removed as electronic signatures are widely accepted. In the board's response, uh, they said, no, some systems only require the first user to sign in for the day. Therefore, the board is adding administrative burden for all companies with adequate operating systems due to the shortcomings of some pharmacies. In comment number 13, I requested that H be amended to allow pharmacies that service ADDSs in settings other than inpatient hospitals to rely on electronic systems and not have to travel to the facilities to physically inventory all at one time, as Maria says. Um, in response to 13, uh, the board staff said that no technology varies based on the ADDS machine and a pharmacy may not always be the one loading the ADDS. So the board is adding administrative burden for pharmacies with adequate ADDS systems who utilize tech restocking due to the shortcomings of some pharmacies. I have spoke to the board many times before about an important component of public safety being the promotion of access to care and that administrative burden will lead to pharmacies closing, which decreases access to care and thus public safety. Such closures are now very much a reality. I request that the unnecessary administrative burden placed on well-run pharmacies as detailed in the board's response to comment 8, 12, and 13 be corrected prior to the 15-day comment period. All right. Seeing no additional requests for comment, would you like me to close the Q&A feature? Yes, please. Thank you so much. And thank you all the commenters. I really appreciate your thoughts. Um, members hearing the comments, anyone have any other comments before we go for the vote? Okay, we're going to go for the vote. All right, starting with Maria again. Maria? Yes. Thank you, Maria. Jake? Yes. Thank you, Jake. Cheryl? Cheryl? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Thank you, Cheryl. Jose? I vote yes. Okay. Thank you, Jose. Ricardo? Well, yes, also. Okay. Thank you, Ricardo. Nicole? Yes. Thank you, Nicole. Debbie Bill? Yes. Thank you, Debbie. Jason Wise? Yes. Thank you, Jason. And I vote yes. The motion passes. All right. Thank you all for um, 
persevering through this. All right, moving on to agenda item seven, adoption of board approved regulation, title 16 CCR section 1746.4, administering vaccines. Um, included in the meeting materials is background information on the regulation. Thank you again to staff and council for preparing responses to the comments received. I'm hopeful you all had an opportunity to review the meeting materials, including the comments received and staff recommendations. Ms. Tatiana and Smiley remain available to answer any legal questions you may have on the language, comments received, and staff recommendations developed in response to comments. In reviewing the comments, I again agree, again agree with the recommendations of staff and would like to hear from other members. And as part of your comments, I would also entertain a motion. Should others agree with the recommendations from staff? I note the meeting materials include a possible motion, which is also, if you could go to the next slide, displayed on the slide. Members, any comments or anyone uh, willing to make a motion? There it is. Um, since the motion is now up, um, this is Debbie. I'd be happy to make that motion. Thank you, Debbie. Anyone second? Second. Thank you, Cheryl. Cheryl seconds. Okay. Any other member comments on this one? Okay. Moving on. Uh, moderator, would please uh, open the lines for public comment. We are now accepting public comment. If you would like to make a comment, please type comment into the Q&A box below. And we and send it to all panelists. We will send you a request to unmute your microphone and you will be given two minutes. Let us take a brief moment to ensure that we have no takers for public comment. Seeing none, would you like me to close the feature? Yes, please. Thank you, moderator. With the motion and second on the floor and public comment received, I will now take a roll call vote. As a reminder, please open your line before voting. All right, again, Maria? Yes. Thank you, Maria Jig Patel? Yes. Cheryl Butler? Yes. Thank you, Cheryl. Jose? Yes. Thank you, Jose. Ricardo? Uh, yes, also. Thank you, Ricardo. Nicole? Yes. Thank you, Nicole. Debbie Beal? Yes. Thank you, Debbie. Jason Wise? Yes. Thank you, Jason. And I vote yes, the motion passes. Thank you, everyone. It is 1155. Um, we could either go to the next agenda item, which is last one before our petition hearing, or go to lunch break, whichever I'm willing to hear what your preference is. I Let's think we do could. it. We could continue. Yeah, All let's right. Let's continue and do lunch before petitioners. Sounds yeah. good. That sounds more. Um, smooth, so I'm glad to hear that. All right, agenda item eight, discussion and consideration of adoption of changes to the board approved regulation, California Code of Regulations, section 1715.6, related to reporting drug losses to address comments from the Office of Administrative Law. The last item of business before we proceed to petition hearings is another regulation package for our consideration. As included in the meeting materials during the board's January 2020 meeting, 2020 meeting, the board approved the proposed regulation. In September 2021, the final rulemaking was submitted to the Office of Administrative Law. Following their review, OAL has requested that the board memorialize its policy decisions into the text of the regulation, as opposed to just detailing the information in the final statement of reason. The meeting materials detail out the specific changes and staff have prepared the recommended modifying text that could be used to implement the changes requested by OAL. I'm hopeful you had an opportunity to review the meeting materials, including the recommended text. Also, Ms. Tatayan and Ms. Smiley continue to be available to answer any legal questions you may have. I again agree with the recommended changes offered by staff and would like to hear from other members. And as part of your comments, I would also entertain a motion should others agree with the recommendations from staff, I know the meeting materials include a possible motion. If you put it to the next slide, please, which is also uh, will be displayed on the slide. Mr. President, this is Maria. Thank you. Hello, Maria. 
Hi, this is another uh, long considered uh, proposed yes. regulation by the Enforcement Committee and the Board of Pharmacy. I'm happy to hear that OAL only had some minor additional wording changes and would like to move to the recommendation. Moderator. It's not on the screen yet. Please um, go to the next screen. As it's coming up, this regulation will certainly improve the uh, reporting requirements required by licensees and board um, staff consideration of reportable events. So I'm waiting for the next slide. Ah, thank you. So uh, that is my motion uh, to agree to uh, the minor modifications of OAL and the rest of the wording that's there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. This is Debbie. Hi, Debbie. I'll second that. Thank you, Debbie. Debbie seconds. Any other member comments before we go to public comment? Nicole, I see you're unmuted. Do you have any questions or concerns? No, sorry. I was just muted on my phone. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Any other comments? Okay, moderator, uh, please open the line for public comment. We have now opened the option for public comment. If you would like to make a comment, please type comment into the Q&A box and send it to all panelists. You will receive a request to unmute yourself and you will be given two minutes. Let us take a brief moment to see if any comments are incoming. Seeing no requests for comments, would you like me to close the feature? Yes, please. Thank you so much. All right, with a motion and second and public comment received, I will now take a roll call vote. Members, as a reminder, please open your line before voting. Maria Serpa? Yes. Thank you, Maria. Jig Patel? Yes. Thank you, Jig. Cheryl Butler? Yes. Thank you, Cheryl. Jose De La Paz? Yes. Thank you, Jose. Uh, Ricardo Sanchez? Uh, yes, also. Thank you, Ricardo. Nicole Thibault? Yes. Thank you, Nicole. Debbie Veal? Yes. Thank you, Debbie. Jason Wise? Yes. Thank you, Jason. And I vote yes. The motion passes. Thank you, everyone. And before we continue, I'd like to um, say that it is my understanding Ms. Tatayan is leaving DCA. On behalf of the board, I would like to thank you for the work you have conducted on behalf of the board to move our regulation packages. We really, really appreciate your work, Ms. Tatayan, and wish you continued success in wherever endeavors you uh, go on to. So thank you, thank you so much. We really appreciate you. Hey, Song, before we also um, yeah. go, I think we should also say thank you to Maria and uh, her committee for uh, slogging through the couple of these uh, Yes, uh, changes that we we've, we've adopted and hopefully uh, moving into regulation uh, here in the near future, because I know it's uh, she's been absolutely ushering them through and uh, appreciate all of her expertise and help on it. Right. Yep. Well, absolutely. Thank you both. But one thing to consider is the previous chair to the enforcement committee really started this process. So it has been going on for many years, even before I was on enforcement. So thank you everyone for moving forward. Yeah, well, it, thank it, you for it, bringing it, it to the finish line then, Maria. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you everyone and all the staff as well to all the work you've done, um, all these regulations, and thank you for enduring through. It took a, it took a little longer, but okay. So we are now going on to our petition hearing, but obviously we're going to take a lunch break. Uh, we're going to take uh, about an hour, so we'll be back at one o'clock. Um, so members, you are free for lunch break. Just a reminder for petition hearing, we will be turning on the camera. Also, I would suggest uh, members, you're all free to go for lunch. I request all the petitioners to be please during the break, be ready to test all your equipments and get the IT challenges resolved. So please, petitioners. Mr. President. Hello? Yes, moderator. Uh, as, as you guys go into break, uh, we would like to take the opportunity to do mic checks uh, before uh, uh, the rest of us go to lunch.
Okay, sounds good. Okay, so petitioner, please uh, work with our moderators in making sure. Debbie, we can see you, so you're good, but see you at one o'clock. Thank you, everybody. We'll see you at one.